one, two, one, two. USB, yeah. plug it in this side, there's a space here, okay, yeah. but make sure they don't take that one away because that connects to that clicker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a number I can give you in case you need this as well. independently by the oh, okay, chaps over there. Oh, okay. So they've been here since oh, a half past six or something like that. So they've been here quite a while.
Kupi. Good morning, everyone. We're running already a bit late. Would be just great to get started, and if you could take your seats, please, would be great. Um, so welcome to this Cambridge um, Trust for New Thinking e Economics conference uh, called Policies to Tackle uh, the Cost of Living Crisis. So I'll be doing some housekeeping, and then I'll end over. First of all, the most important is on the screen. So if there's a, if uh, in the unlikely event of the fire alarm sounding, um, as a continuous bell, immediately by the nearest exit, fire exit. Next note is for me, so the fire exit, one is over there, another one is behind the banner here. And do not, do not stop to collect your belongings. Please leave in an orderly manner, so stay calm. Uh, on, on exiting the building, please assemble on the cross opposite the entrance of, to the building and wait for further instructions. Do not return to the building until you're allowed to do so. So I've done that, that's the most important thing I have to tell you. Um, then toilets are uh, located on the ground floor. floor. There's lift taking you there, or you can use the stairs. Um, and I think that's all about housekeeping we have to do. And happy International Women's Day to everyone. So we have only men speaking today, so we gave a day off for women. <laughs> so I will be enjoying, <laughs> enjoying that. So it's, um, we'll be still here to support and clap and do everything, you know. Uh, I'm not giving a presentation. I'm just help supporting, you know, uh, and saying how glad I'm to see you all here. So we'll be, um, this uh, event is broadcasted, is filmed. So if you don't like to be in camera, we sent, you about, uh, we sent an email about this to all of you. So just let us know and we let the cameraman know that you don't want to appear in the, uh, in the film. Um, but no one said no, so I assume you all fine with that, that the event is filmed. Um, I think I stop here, that's the housekeeping. I hand over to Terry and I wish you a very nice conference. <coughs> well, thank you very much, Anella. Um, it's very good that everybody's here, um, and you're very, very welcome. And I thought I'd start this in an unusual manner. You need to really stand. I need to be to the here. Microphone. Okay. I can use the microphone. Yep. Isn't that good? Yes. So, can everybody hear me? Um, we can. Yes. Good. So what, what I'm suggesting, the way we start this conference, is by saying, turning to our neighbor and saying, welcome. Welcome to our world, because this is our world. Welcome. Welcome to our world. This is our world. Anyway, enough of the jokes. Um, it's my uh, privilege to um, open this conference, although Anella's actually opened it. First of all, to say thank you to Anella for organizing it, and Ellen for also being here. Ellen's at the back, and Ellen's the project officer. Is that correct? Yes. So Ellen will be looking after you. And I should also say that we're live streaming, so... Everything you say, everything I say, will be broadcast to the world on YouTube and probably is being broadcast at the moment. So don't be nervous. Just look at me. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> um, anyway, so this conference is about the cost of living crisis. And now we've become really serious because there is a cost of living crisis in many countries, not just in the UK, and governments haven't done very well in coping with it. But one government is doing something really interesting, and that is the Mexican government. And I found out about this from uh, a former student of mine, Rogelio de la O, Dr. Rogelio de la O, 
who um, has a very important position in the Mexican government. He's the equivalent of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, and we're going to hear from him. But my job now, first of all, is to introduce conference and welcome you all to Downing College, to this lovely room. And we are occupying the room very well, if I may say so, with our tables. Um, and it's very comfortable. And it's also very good acoustics here, you'll notice. Much better than in some of the other buildings, which have got marble floors. So without much more ado, may I introduce the person who is going to introduce our speaker, and that is our new trustee, Dr. Carolina Alves, who is now working in London, I believe, but was the Joan Robinson Fellow at, at uh, Girton College. Um, I'm managing to do this out actually looking at the notes, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, well, we have had a good talk about Joan Robinson and Joan Robinson philosophy, and we will talk later about um, workshops which we're planning to have, um, including a workshop on time and money in economic thought, something like that. Anyway, if I may hand over to Carolina. Thank you very much, Cher Cher uh, Terry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you uh, as well for inviting me to uh, yeah, become a trustee. Uh, I'm really proud. Uh, I first attained um, the new uh, economic, the new uh, thinking in economics trust in 2015, as a second year PhD student. So I'm really proud to be back as you know, a chair, but also uh, a trustee. Uh, so before we start our first panel, just let, just please, if you can keep your uh, mobile phones and, and iPads and computer. Are you okay? On uh, silent would be um, yeah, much appreciated. So, yeah, so we are here with this uh, timely uh, conference on uh, how to tackle the cost of living crisis. So we have our first uh, panel with uh, um, Francisco Arias, I'm going to introduce soon, and also with uh, Jeff Crocker that I'm going to introduce soon, and you basically, we're going to be talking about the, the cost living crisis, but also the case for basic income. So let me introduce our uh, two amazing uh, speakers. So Francisco Arias, thank you for being here today. Uh, we'll be talking about straightening uh, lower income households throughout the cost of living crisis, the Mexico, Mexico's approach. Right? <laughs> and uh, Dr. Francisco Javier Rios Vasquez is the head of the tax policy unit at the Ministry of Finance in Mexico. Oh, thank you <laughs> for coming. Uh, a position he has held since 2018. He has previous, previously been an economist at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., and at Mexico's Central Bank. So lots of uh, experience in policy, which is quite important uh, for academia. Um, Dr. Rios has been a visiting professor at Yale University, and he's currently a professor at Mexico's National University, UNAM, which is uh, the largest university in Latin America and probably the best university in Latin America. <laughs> he earned a PhD in economics at the University of Chicago, having previously earned a BA in economics at UNAM and a, M and a master in economics at El College uh, de Mexico. His research has focused on the field of political economy and labor economics. Francisco talk will focus on Mexico's approach to the cost of living of crisis and also the income support measures in Mexico. Uh, so after that, we got uh, Jeff uh, Crocker to uh, follow that uh, discussion uh, to talk about the case of basic income. So Jeff's career become oh in the uh, aerospace sector, and he has since uh, uh, worked in an industry strategy for over 25 years, specializing in strategic analysis of international industry sectors with high technology content for senior client manage management. Uh, Jeff has worked extensively as a uh, advocate for basic income, launching and editing the website The Case for uh, Basic Income, and I invited everybody to check that out. And through his recent book, Basic Income and Solving Money, The Alternative to Economic Crisis and Austerity Policy. He has also helped initiate a research project on economics of the basic income at IPR Bath, the basic income conversation hub hosted at Compass the UK, and the conference Is It Time for the Basic Income at the Bristol Festival of Ideas. 
Jeff's presentation addresses the role of technology in reducing labor income, leading to a macroeconomic case of a universal basic income. Uh, funding basic income by direct money financing, where money is no longer defined as debt at the point of its creation, is modeled to demonstrate its system equilibrium and offer a, a stimulation tool. So thank you both for being here today and you're looking forward to your uh, talk. Hello. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Professor Terry Berker. Uh, thank you, Anela, for, for the invitations. And on behalf of uh, Mr. Rogelio Ramirez de la O, my boss and uh, former student of Professor Berker, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to start the, the presentation with an outlook of like social programs in Mexico. Then I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the strategy to raise the revenues that we needed to expand the social programs. Then um, a brief uh, explanation of the main, the main programs, the main axis that, that we did in expanding the programs. Um, a little bit about an econometrics exercise that we did to uh, study the implications of the programs in the labor markets. We tested the neoclassical view of, of labor markets with a very interesting uh, econometric analysis. I'm going I'm to show it. And finally, uh, talk a bit about the macroeconomic stability and how we uh, implement this strategy while maintaining the fiscal, um, the fiscal balance and, and the macroeconomic equilibrium. Um, I have like 25 minutes. I'm going to put my... Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, in Mexico, um, since the 90s, um, the social programs uh, excluded uh, most of the population that uh, were like vulnerable, vulnerable sectors of the population. And these, uh, these programs uh, were, uh, the, the approach was uh, budget allocation and means tested rules. And as you know, means tested rules uh, refers to programs where eligibility uh, is conditional to certain characteristics of the households. And in the past years, in the, in the last couple of years, the COVID crisis, the, the energy and food inflation, uh, invite us to, to rethink the scope of social programs. And, okay. The approach uh, in, since 2018, and when the new administration uh, took office, um, and it's important to say it, it is, this new administration is, is the first uh, left-wing government in Mexico since the, since the democracy was, was installed. And the, the one of the main um, uh, economic policies was to expand uh, social programs to and make them like uh, universal in terms of eligibility and uh, move from uh, means tested programs to, to these programs on university eligibility. Um, an important aspect of this transformation was to knock down the program's bureaucracy and reduce uh, redundant administrative costs. Um, historically, uh, the social programs in Mexico were plagued with costly bureaucracy and red tape and, and corruption. So um, this was one of the, of the main uh, actions that we took in terms of, of, of welfare policy. Um, and again, uh, I want to I emphasize, and, and I'm going to show some numbers at the end of the presentation, that this strategy was, um, was possible first because we implement a strategy to mobilize uh, public revenues and this allows us to maintain the, the public sector balances, as, as I mentioned before, and, and the macroeconomic equilibriums. Um, so this first, this, this graph, we, we see the uh, Mexican tax revenue also a percentage of GDP, also a measure in terms of the size of the economy. 
And what we see is that in the, since, since we started this strategy, we have been uh, increasing tax collection uh, from the early years of the administration to, to the end of 2022, like last, last December, we increased uh, tax collection by uh, around 1.5 percentage points of GDP. Um, maybe like to put in a, in a, in a context, uh, low tax collection is a, a structural pro problem, not only in Mexico, but in most uh, Latin American countries. Um, the reasons are um, excessive uh, tax incentives, uh, special reduced rates, for example, on the VAT, um, and another uh, important uh, obstacle for, for tax collection is um, the, the, these problems of tax, of tax evasion, tax elution, and, and that I'm going to talk a bit in, uh, about that and our strategy to increase revenues. Um, here I'm going to very briefly mention uh, we did a fiscal reform for the digital economy. A lot of the taxes from uh, online tra transactions were, were, uh, were very easy to evade. So we, we up, up, update our tax system to capture those, those revenues. We also um, started a, a new strategy in terms of tax administration to monitor and surveillance uh, tax reforms. That was another, another, another important uh, measure. Uh, we increased the penalties for tax evasion. Um, unfortunately, in Mexico, one, of one very common activity was the, the sale of, um, let's say, fake e electronic invoices and we uh, address this, this, this problem. And finally, uh, you probably know the OECD strategy on, on base erosion and profit shifting that basically multinational organization um, transfer profits from to, towards uh, jurisdictions with low taxes. So we, we implemented several measures to, to tackle that, that problem. And those measures um, explain the graph on the left, the, the increase in, in, in um, around 1.5 percentage points of GDP. Here, um, the two main taxes, the income tax, increases by almost one percentage point of GDP. That explains most of the, most of the increase on, on tax collection from the previous slide. And um, on the right uh, graph, we see the, the value added tax. We, we improve the, the revenues on zero point percentage point of GDP. Um, I, I actually don't, don't know how much, how is the, the tax collection in the UK. Um, I guess it's around nine, 20 percentage points of GDP. I mean, that's, that's more or less the average on the OECD countries. But in, in terms of a Latin American country that we have had historically low tax collection, these amounts are, are uh, quite significant in, in terms of, of, of advancing this strategy of mobilizing revenue. Uh, so here is the first part. Uh, in order to expand the, the coverage and the scope of social programs, first we needed to increase uh, uh, public revenues. And here, um, the new um, universal uni programs with universal coverage, uh, there are, we focus on, uh, the first one is a, a, a basic income for, for everybody which is uh, about six, 65 years old, like the pension for the elderly, grants to disabled po the disabled population, uh, again, it's a universal coverage for all the, all, all the vulnerable households with uh, disabled uh, members. Uh, grants for students, every, every student from elementary school until high school um, that attends a public, uh, a public school has a, a, a grant. And, and finally, um, the small agricultural producers, every, every, everyone in, in, in this in, uh, sector have, uh, again, a, 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 a grant which allows them to obtain the, um, the basket of consumption, the minimum basket of consumption. And 
this, this graph um, shows how um, the expenditure increase in order to provide these new social programs. And again, on the red, on, on the red bars is um, the past uh, 15 years, and an average, uh, the expenditure was around 3.5 percentage point of GDP. And starting in, in 2019, when the programs started to be impl implemented, um, we see an increase in, in, in expenditure. And the, in December 2022, we see that the social expenditure reached a uh, historical maximum of 5.3 percentage points of GDP. So this uh, uh, shows how we um, uh, increase uh, the welfare programs in terms of, of expenditure. Um, I want to I want to um, mention something that is is very important. When we uh, give these um, grants, uh, the there is a one to one um, that translates to private consumption. And in the economic recovery after the um, after the crisis, consumption has been uh, one of the main um, buffers to economic activity. And this is because the propensity to consume is, is one for, for these households. Like um, the social expenditures uh, goes, go move, goes back the, to the, oh, sorry. Oh. Um, those households, like every additional income, uh, goes again to the economy as an increase in, in consumption. And I don't have a here estimation of the of the multiplier, but it seems that the multiplier is is so is what is explaining that the aggregate demand is is being stimulated with these programs. That's something that um, that we we identified. Okay, this is. Um, Complementing the to complement the the social programs, uh, what we see here is the new uh, policy in terms of minimum wages. Um, the the red line tells us the annual growth of the minimum wage since 2006, and we see that over the for the from 2006 to 2018. Basically, the, the growth of the minimum wage, even in, in some, year, some years, uh, the minimum wage uh, declined. So in terms of the um, portancy power of workers, we see uh, uh, that the minimum wage was basically uh, frozen in, in, in these years. And one of the, the first things that we did in, in this administration was uh, to adjust the secondary uh, legislation of the minimum wage. And we see the aggressive uh, strategy to, to increase the minimum wage. Uh, only in, two, in the first year of the administration, uh, we increased the minimum wage by almost 19% in real terms, or controlling for inflation. In, the, in 2020, the, the year of the economic crisis, the minimum wage increased by almost 14%, and, and, and we see um, a structural change in terms and in the evolution of the minimum wage. And before, before we, we started this strategy, um, some economists at the central bank, some, some economists in the academia predicted that um, uh, in, uh, in line with the neoclassical view of the labor market, that this will create uh, unemployment. That's the, the first, the, the common view or the neoclassical view of, of the labor markets. Um, if we look at the stylized facts um, on the red, on the red uh, line, we have the unemployment rate. And w what we see is that unemployment not, uh, not increased, but actually uh, the, 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 the tendency is to have to, it's a declining unemployment rate. This is the, and also I want to mention the cumulative real growth of, of the real wage in, in the Dears administration is around 60% in, 
it's an important recovery uh, on, on the workers' uh, purchasing power. And so here is just the stylized facts. Increasing the minimum wage um, does not uh, create an unemployment. And going like a little bit deep on, on this, on this uh, testing, this you know, classical view on the labor markets, um, we use a natural experiment that uh, goes as follows. In the northern uh, municipalities of Mexico, in 2019, the, uh, the policy was to increase the minimum wage uh, as twice of increase in the rest of the country. And also, uh, in the municipalities of the border region, we reduced the VAT rate from the statutory rate of 16% to 8%. And this was a, a policy to protect, protect uh, households and workers in the northern border because they have a disadvantage in terms of competition with the municipalities of the United States on the other side of the border. So if we think of a natural experiment in terms of the treatment group and the control group, we can, see, we can think on, on, on the municipalities of the northern part of Mexico in the border of the treated group that had a an increase in the minimum wage of twice as large of in the rest of the country. And we have as a control group the municipalities that are very similar to those in the border, but they are located in, in, inside the country. And this, um, this uh, uh, natural experiment of having some households treated with uh, a large uh, increase in the minimum wage versus the ones that um, didn't have that, that increase allows to uh, run these uh, fixed effect uh, uh, estimations uh, of this uh, uh, microeconometrics analysis of panel data and the advantage of this uh, strategy of, of the fixed effects estimator is that um, the usual uh, endogeneity bias of OLS regressions due to unobservable characteristics, once we uh, write down the specification of the fixed effects model, uh, this model allows us to remove any unobservable and time invariant, I guess I can, Oh, no, no, I don't have a laser, but <laughs> well, basically in any, in these two specifications, what, what we are looking is at the impact of an increase in the minimum wage on inflation. That's the first equation, that is the, the log of the consumer price index. And in the bottom equation, what we have is the unemployment rate. And what we are interested is in the coefficient beta, beta, beta 2 and beta 4, which is basically the, the impact of the minimum wage on inflation and the impact of the minimum wage on uh, unemployment. Um, uh, if we look at any textbook of, of, of microeconomics, we'll, we'll suggest that um, the coefficients will be uh, positive and uh, statistical significant. And what we see in, in the results of the relation is, is that uh, neither of those coefficients have, uh, are statistical different from zero. And so this econometric analysis that we think is quite robust uh, dis dis discredits the, the neoclassical view of the labor markets in the Mexican economy. And since the Mexican economy is kind of like a representative of a uh, uh, developing economy, um, it's, we, I, I found it very, very interesting that this, this uh, um, argument that uh, for decades uh, prevented the minimum wages in Mexico to increase, it's, um, it's a flow, it's, it's, it's not, from my point of view, it's, it's we lost decades not increasing the minimum wage and um, just because this, this argument, and, and we see that it's not robust to, to, to the empirical evidence. Um, then some, some uh, very uh, 
talented colleagues um, did a similar analysis um, using the treatment group as the, the municipalities in the northern border and um, the, as a control group, some municipalities in the rest of the country. And what they uh, look it was at the net effect of the minimum wage and the reduced rate of the value added tax using um, the um, the econometric te technique of the synthetic control method, which is basically taking a linear combination on all the observations in the, in the treatment group and compare it with a linear combination on municipalities on the control group. And what we see in, in the results on, on this graph on the right side is that uh, starting on January 2019, when, when, the, when the, the policy was implemented in, in the northern municipalities, um, we see how the treatment group had a lower inflation. What we have in the vertical axis is inflation rate, and we have the time, the time dimension on the horizontal axis. And we see that they had a pre-trend, a common pre-trend, like both groups, which is one of the of the assumptions of this on this of this econometric model that before the treatment both groups uh, behave like in a similar way, and, now, and when we have the treatment, uh, they diverge, and 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 the the the, the households that had uh, lower VAT and has like a lower inflation. So this is a, a, another. Uh, piece of evidence that um, these uh, this, uh, economic policies to protect vulnerable households um, do not have any secondary effects uh, in line with, with the neoclassical point of view of, of the labor markets. And finally, uh, I want to um, show you some, some numbers of the uh, macroeconomic stability of Mexico and we have the government gross debt as a percentage of GDP and we see that between 2018 and 2020 the uh, debt of Mexico increased by 3.2 percentage point of GDP and when we compare this, uh, this uh, increase in the debt with some other countries in Latin America, for example, Colombia, Chile, that increase here in the, in, the laf, in, the, in the last column, the debt increased by seven points, percentage points, Chile 11, uh, Brazil is kind of similar to Mexico, 2.6, but then we see Canada, Spain, even United States, like two digits increase in, in the debt. So the, uh, the conclusion or, or the, mesh, the message I, I want to I wanna transmit to you is that we did this expansion on the un universality of eligibility of social programs. We did these uh, uh, policies to protect workers, increasing the minimum wage. And we did it without any um, side effects, see, uh, us like the neoclassical uh, point of view of the labor markets would predict. And also we did it maintaining the uh, uh, macroeconomic balances as we can uh, summarize with, this, with these numbers of a very uh, responsible and prudent uh, management of, of, the, of the public finances. And I think I'm running out like exactly of, of like 25 minutes. So um, we uh, redesigned the social policy in, in the last three years with, with, the new, with this new government, with new, this new administration, uh, with innovative and pro-worker approach to labor markets. And uh, we see that the empirical evidence is not consistent with the neoclassical view of the labor markets. Uh, the, the initial results of the social program are uh, promising and the full impacts uh, still needs some time to consolidate but we are in on the right direction and um, the fiscal approach uh, as I show at, at the beginning um, focus on, on, on increased revenue and with that additional public revenue we finance 
the uh, expenditure and the welfare, welfare measures. And the macro stability, and that is very important, that I show you in the last slide. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francisco. So we have like a yeah. few minutes yeah. just for uh, clarification. If you have any questions, um, that's more around a clarification question is fine because you're gonna have more time for debate after Jeff's presentation. So mm -hmm. if it's okay, Terry, do not oh, just could you say something? Sorry, could you say something about the oil sector and the oil price because that is dominating the world economy, the increases in oil and gas prices. The, 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 sorry, the, what? the increase in oil and gas prices okay. and, and, and its effect on the budget. Yes, um, as you know, Mexico is a net export of oil. So the prices uh, in 2021 um, that at some point reached more than $100 per barrel, like favor the, the, the public finances. But uh, that's a really important question because um, Mexico and any other country that depends, the public finance depends on, on commodities. As you know, the price of commodities are very volatile. So is sometimes we are favored by the international uh, and the global prices, but also we are vulnerable when we have situations that in 2020, actually, I remember one day, the future price of oil was negative. <laughs> so. What we have done is that we try to um, despetrolize the economy, or what I'm trying to say, that try to rely more on, on a stable sources of tax collection and less on uh, oil revenues. And what we, uh, what I, we saw in, 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 in one of the slides, tax collection has increased and that's like a, a stable source of uh, funds and I didn't show you, but the oil of revenues as a percentage of GDP have been declining. So we are trying to uh, rely more on stable sources and less on oil revenue, because oil revenue is unstable and, 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 and that's, that's been part of the strategy. Great. Yeah. Okay, Francisco, yeah. thank you very much. It was a fascinating presentation. Yeah. It's, it's always good to, uh, to see empirical evidence that there's no correlation between increasing real wages and unemployment, at least not in the way we are taught yeah. within the orthodoxy. So, exactly. yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, so, Jeff, if you want to uh, please um, take the stage. Do you want me to help you? just need to set my presentation up. Thanks, that was great. Yep. Do you know how to do that? Thanks. I don't know if I've got the slide here. Thank you. Good. Well, thanks uh, very much for um, inviting me to speak. And uh, in line with the idea of new thinking in economics, I want to present the proposal for basic income in the context of um, flying some kites uh, of new ideas, which I invite you to shoot down. And the advantage I have over other speakers is that I have no reputation to lose if I'm wrong. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'd like to talk about the macroeconomics of basic income and sovereign money, but I want to rethink or suggest some rethinking of income and money and the role of technology. So um, my first call or plea, if you like, um, or cri de coeur, is for, um, um, for technology and its role in the economy to become more incorporated in standard economic theory. Um, you know, Marx and uh, Keynes both make passing references to technology in their works, but there is no formal consolidation of the role of technology in economics, because I spent most of my consulting career looking at the impact of technology in various industries and on various national economies. So I have on the left there um, a, a brief idea of how an integrated economy would include nature, technology, employment, income, uh, money, and, of course, economic outcomes. So the call on the right there to uh, 
uh, incorporate technology into economic theory is for these reasons, because it clearly invents a myriad of products and services for consumption, so it drastically affects the consumption opportunities um, and the consumption function. Secondly, it radically alters the capital labour production function you know, in favour of uh, capital input and to reduce labour input by the automation which technology makes available. Um, th thus then affects employment and labour income, a point I'll go on to make, which generates an argument for basic income. Um, overall, its uh, pro productivity is what delivers prosperity. Um, and in internet technologies, the information flows that are available to us all now massively uh, enable um, optimi optimization of transactions um, and just the effect of transactions, you know, you buy your railway ticket or whatever else it is. So technology has got huge impacts on economic structures, on economic outcomes, and yet is underrepresented in the body of economic theory, apart from contributions from the late Nathan Rosenberg, uh, working in California in his 1992 book, Technology and the Wealth of Nations, and Giovanni Dossi um, in his 1988, Technical Change in Economic Theory. So, you know, there are some publications out there, but it's not uh, massively noticeable. So, I look at dysfunctionality in the present economic paradigm, and we are all aware of these dysfunctionalities, and I've sectioned them there in terms of income and debt. So we see inadequate income um, in the economy. Uh, we see the, the phenomenon of in-work poverty, which of course is uh, a demonstration of the, of the fact that work and wage and full employment, which have always been the policies since the, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, which we hoped would deliver adequacy of income, are now failing to do so because we have in-work poverty. Uh, we're facing low pay, we're facing massive inequality, not only generally in society, but also, as we know, within the workplace. So senior executives are uh, remunerated in the millions and the people on so-called bullshit jobs are getting uh, 20,000 or less to live on. So there's massive inequality. Full employment is now failing to deliver adequate income. Because the argument that's often uh, made for, uh, w well, against basic income is that, well, we have full employment. We have full employment, but we don't have adequate delivery of household income. And at the same time, we have excessive debt. We've got excessive debt both in terms of household debt um, and in terms of uh, national debt, with national debt figures, as we've seen in the recent presentation, exceeding 100% of GDP, and in the case of Japan, hitting 265% of GDP. So that excessive debt generates crisis because the debt becomes at some point unrepayable, um, and, it and it generates austerity because at some arbitrary point, and it does seem to be arbitrary, uh, governments suddenly say, oh, we can't accumulate further debt, therefore we must impose austerity measures. So this paradigm has significant social damage uh, written into it. And that's where, in my view, new thinking in economics uh, requires us to step back, critique the paradigm, um, and see where it might be redefined. At the same time, we're seeing significant ecolog ecological damage because the trust in full employment as the generator of income means that we're always looking for more jobs, more production, more output, more consumption, more resource depletion, uh, more emission and pollution, and so on. So I'm suggesting at the bottom this needs a radical rethink and the uh, economic system needs uh, re-engineering. So the explanatory uh, hypothesis that I float is that technology is reducing um, aggregate labour income and at the same time accumulating debt, and I'll go on to show why and how I think that is, um, that the policy target that we need is, is a, a bifocal policy target, one, to get income to people, and B, to get debt out of the system, and that the policy instruments for that are a basic income, i.e. a universal and conditional income, um, and de and debt-free sovereign money, also known as direct monetary funding of government expenditure. Now, these are fairly radical ideas, um, which have often been... Uh, been treated with scorn, frankly, by the economic uh, press. And uh, Paul Johnson's recent book pours huge scorn on the idea of basic income on page 90, and I've posted a riposte to that um, 
only yesterday. So we are, if you like, flying in the face of orthodoxy. Um, orthodoxy is always difficult to challenge. Orthodoxy is always difficult to change. The, the German scientist Max Planck said that scientific theory famously changes one funeral at a time, you know, that it requires an older generation of orthodoxy uh, to make way for what are currently regarded as heterodox views. So um, here's a thought experiment that um, if we had a totally automated economy, you know, in this thought experiment, which has limitations, of course, as all thought experiments do, um, if an, a machine could be plugged into the earth to produce all the goods and services needed without any labor, therefore without any wage, how would the goods and services be distributed? Uh, clearly by some kind of voucher everybody's given. The vouchers are handed in for the goods and services, and in my version of the thought experiment, the vouchers are destroyed when they are handed in for the goods and services, then the vouchers are reissued the following year. So it's a simplistic thought experiment. But in that uh, thought experiment, 100% of the GDP becomes a basic income. Um, and 100% of GDP uh, also becomes sovereign money, i.e. debt-free vouchers simply given out for people to, to, to turn in for their goods and services. So the nuance of the argument, I claim, is that to the degree that production is automated, to that degree there is a structural requirement for non-labour income in the economy. Um, so here's an attempt to show how that works. So uh, automation is increasing, increasing productivity in terms of output per hour worked. It's reducing wages per unit of output. Um, and real wages then tend to lag productivity, which has been in the story in the United States for the last 30 years, according to commentators like Joe Stiglitz. So robots may not have yet destroyed jobs, um, but it's on the way. Um, so you go on London Underground, of course, as you know, there no, there's nobody in the ticket offices anymore. Um, the an increasing number of services when you, you encounter nobody, um, they're automated. Um, and the argument is that, number one, this is sucking income out of the economy. Um, number two, it's bivocating employment to high-pay specialty jobs and low-pay bullshit jobs and driving inequality. And number three, that alongside that, it's reducing labour bargaining power. Uh, so we end up with households forced into increasing debt, governments uh, forced into increasing national debt, the imposition of austerity, uh, crisis austerity, and all the indicators move in the wrong direction. Um, here's some empirical evidence on income, that labour income declines consistently versus consumer expenditure from the whole post-war period. So that's tracking consumer expenditure and labour income inexorably over a very long-run period, showing that uh, consumer disposable income becomes increasingly inadequate uh, to fund um, consumer expenditure. Therefore, other sources of income, whether they're pensions, dividends, welfare benefits, or worryingly household debt, are, are making up that gap. Um, so, uh, Joe Crisp, who's with us, is going to be presenting later some work that uh, we've done together at the uh, Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath, seeking to examine this claim that technology is reducing the labour share in the economy. Um, I've given the link there, and of course I'll leave the presentation to Joe later. Turning to the ontology of money, so what I've said so far is trying to address the ontology of, of income. Um, i.e. that it is no longer in print derived so much from work and wage. If we look at the ontology of uh, money, we can see in these familiar pictures that uh, debt has been booming everywhere. Uh, so the top one there is UK household debt over that period of time. Second one on the top is EU national debt, with the average there just under 100% in the EU. Um, and uh, on the right is OECD countries' debt, with, of course, the famous uh, uh, mega example of Japan. Japan having 265% of its GNP um, as its national debt. And as most commentators, Adair Turner, Joe Stiglitz, and so on, have said, this debt is unrepayable. You know, you cannot repay 265% of your GDP. And therefore, the concept of it is debt is, I would claim, illusory, is, is a delusion, um, and therefore we need to think about redefinitions of the financial flows and redefinition of the concept of money. 
Um, so the bottom graph here said, so sh um, again, as your presentation showed, that in low-income countries, economies, they are actually denied debt, is the way I would phrase it. Um, and so in this scatter diagram here, which is debt to GDP ratio along the x-axis and GDP per capita along the y-axis, I mean, this is a fairly simplistic uh, diagnosis at this moment in time, but the implication is that in order to be a wealthy economy, you need a high debt to GDP ratio. Um, and, of course, um, all Western economies have breached the Maastricht 60% criterion a long time ago. Um, in the meantime, the economic analysts I talk to in developing economies say that they are forced to abide by this 55 to 60% limit of GDP per capita. So the argument there is, if we could release... Um, income to people through a basic income funded by debt-free sovereign money, even if we increase the debt, uh, allowed money to be emitted, or um, created money without calling it debt, fed it into um, uh, low-income households, that that, in a Keynesian fashion, would stimulate local production, uh, investment, and grow the economy. Um, so, here's um, my claim on the, the debt delusion. So, I'm slightly borrowing Stephanie Kelton's phrase, which she calls the defi deficit uh, delusion. Um, here's my argument on the debt delusion. So, there is, as you know, a prohibition in most jurisdictions on uh, direct money financing of government expenditure. It's a no-no, it's a no-go, it's not supposed to happen. Um, but, I claim, it's necessary and so is done indirectly. And the indirect mechanism is that uh, governments in their primary markets sell government bonds to pension funds, insurance companies, uh, foreign central banks, um, stockbrokers and rich individuals. And the central bank, which is denied um, access to the primary market, can only then go and buy government bonds in the secondary market from those traders in the primary market. And that's what's happening. Um, to the extent that uh, in the UK, at the bottom line says, the Bank of England owns £875 billion worth of government debt. So 40 to 50% worth of government debt is held by the central bank. But since the government owns the central bank, or in the case of the US, the Fed is not owned by the Treasury, in fact, but is required to pay all its surpluses to the Treasury, then the argument is that this is equivalent to zero net debt. Um, because... The, bank, the central bank is owned by the same government. Um, of course, there is an accounting convention that when the central bank creates money, um, this is written as a, uh, as a debt assumption. Um, that is current practice, forced by the assumption of double-entry accounting at the point of money creation. My claim is that whilst that's the case, that it is not necessarily so. It doesn't have to be accounted as debt. This is simply an accounting convention which is restrictive and unnecessary. The other byproduct of this system is that it gives huge risk free margins to traders in the primary market. So, all the pension funds, insurance companies, stockbrokers, and so on, who bought the 875 billion of government debt in the primary market and then sold it onto the Bank of England, enjoy a risk free margin for doing nothing. Now, one of the senior FT uh, writers said to me at uh, lunch a couple of weeks ago, oh, yes, but it's not a very big percentage that they make. But as I said, you don't need a very big percentage on 875 billion um, for it to create, frankly, a national scandal. So, um, and of course, then this accumulates unrepayable national debts, which nevertheless impose interest financing currently working its way towards £100 billion a year in the UK for paying the interest cost on the debt and the imposition of um, austerity policy. So my argument is that uh, debt-free sovereign money exists. <coughs> it is actually the case currently, and I'm proposing that we should recognise it and shift it from being de facto to being de jure. Um, and uh, moving into basic income and... Quickly, the claim has always been that UBI is either too small to be meaningful or too large to be affordable, a claim made by the famous John Kay. And of the funding options for a basic income, running from revenue neutrality to the wealth tax, land tax and eco-taxes, um, each of which I think have their qualifying critique, 
i.e. wealth taxes are very difficult to manage and have been withdrawn where they've been implemented. Land tax, we're no longer an agricultural economy and it doesn't take tax from the most profitable companies. Eco-tax should reduce pollution and not raise funds. So we're into the concept of funding money, uh, funding a basic income by debt-free sovereign money. The only way to deliver the adequate basic income, consistent argument from the thought experiment, and the pilot has been delivered by the COVID economy because in the UK furlough scheme, we pay £24,000 a year to 3 million people costing £69 billion, all of which was funded within that Bank of England purchase of £875 billion of government debt. So my claim is this is, of course, an unwelcome pilot because it was a result of COVID, but nevertheless a pretty compelling uh, pilot exercise in favour of the argument. So it does get income to people and debt out of the economy and that has been run in models by Cambridge Econometrics which Chris is going to present in his uh, presentation. So um, the case of basic income runs through social justice, it's the best welfare system because it's less intrusive, it avoids employment, unemployment traps, it avoid, avoids poverty traps, um, it's ecologically sound, it allows human flourishing, you know, why should we be trapped by the 8 to 4 factory or the 9 to 5 office? You know, this is an artefact that we have imposed upon ourselves unnecessarily. Um, and the macroeconomic case that I've been making so far, that policy and philosophy um, and the whole concept of the ontology of humanity should become less work-centric. Um, and finally, uh, there's my book, um, which uh, was mentioned earlier, which I mention without any commercial interest because I get zero royalties from it, um, but it's there if you're interested. So thank you very much, and um, over to you, Jeff. Thank you very thank much, you. Um, Jeff. So again, we have, uh, you know, actually, we can just uh, initiate the debate. So it's um, 22, so we have uh, 35 minutes for discussion. So if you can... Actually, Frances Francisco, if you wanted to use that, then I can go around with the mic. I think it would be uh, easier. So, yeah, if, please stay on the stage, yes. So, yeah, questions. Here we go. Can, can I also ask, perhaps this is just my uh, own interest, because I missed dinner yesterday and I was late for um, breakfast today. So, can you please introduce, say your name and introduce yourself as well? <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is um, Aracel Corso. I'm, uh, I work at Standard Chartered. Um, I, I'm inter I have two questions uh, on Mexico. One of them, I just wanted a clarification on um, receipts, foreign sort of money flows from the US to Mexico. How significant are they relative to the size of the social programs over the period that, that you, you did them? Yeah. Uh, and also, there's this phenomenon of delisting of large corporations from the Bolsa, uh, it, obviously companies that are on the Bolsa are having to face greater scrutiny. Uh, is that potentially a way that they are avoiding having to pay tax? Okay. Yeah, the first question is about the remittance that um, we receive from, from Mexican uh, people that like migrate to the US. They, um, the exact number is, I think it's around one percentage point of, of GDP and um, it is a, an important source of, of, there's actually a paper that um, uh, identified that the regions with more, more, more migrants in the United States are more likely to escape from poverty. Definitely is a, an important source of, of income for, for those households. And the size, your question, the size in terms of the social programs, I think it's like a 50% of the, of the social programs. And, um, and that, well, it's ha half of the size. And we relied in, in on, that, on that revenue. And the second question, uh, uh, yeah, you, you read the, the newspapers of Mexico. We, we are experiencing uh, the listing of some, of some firms. Um, the, the, the Mexican market never like um, never uh, got the size of other uh, advanced economies. We have around uh, 100 firms in, in the Bolsa, which is like a really small market. And we have observed like a delisting of like around 10 firms in the, in the past years. 
I'm not quite sure if that's related to a strategy to avoid taxes or is being a strategy or a business strategy that has to do more on like the corporate finance of, of these firms. And I don't think it's necessarily uh, have an implication in terms of, of taxes. Yeah. Thank you, Francisco. I think we should, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Richard Looney, uh, Cambridge Econometrics and the Cambridge Trust. Uh, Francisco, thanks for a really interesting presentation. I just want to focus on the uh, raising of the minimum wage. Um, and uh, I, I don't know what the, the coverage of that would be in terms of the percentage of the workforce. Presumably it applies to those in formal employment and not informal. So just to have some idea of the, the scope of it. But the other question uh, in my mind is... Um, yeah, this is an effect, effect a social program that's paid for by the employers. So I'm um, expecting that there would have been pushback from the employers and complaints about potential loss of competitiveness and maybe especially from um, multinational companies exporting. I'm just wondering if there's you know, been any reaction like that. Okay. Yes, um, the first question uh, has to do with, um, with this phenomenon that when you move the minimum wage, you also move the entire distribution of, of wages. This is like a, the Faro effect. I mean, this, this is like a, an effect that you move the entire distribution. And, and that's exactly wha why it's important to move the minimum wage. Because if you move the minimum wage and only the workers who earn a minimum wage are going to be benefit, it's, it's okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's a target policy. But when you move the minimum wage, you impact if not the entire distribution, at least uh, all the lower end of the, of the wage distribution. And that's exactly what, what we have seen, and there are some papers that actually measure that. So the uh, scope of this uh, uh, policy of, of, of recovering the purchasing mm -hmm. power of the minimum wage uh, um, uh, impacts uh, 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 more w workers than those that earn the minimum wage. The exact uh, uh, figure I can tell you that, and this is, ad and again, when you move the minimum wage, of course, you target the formal workers, but there is also an impact on the informal workers because you move the entire distribution. So um, just to give you a number, the informality rate is around 40%. So it means that four out of 10 workers uh, are in the informal sector and presumably they don't have uh, social security, and that's why the other programs are very important, the ones with universal eligibility. I don't know if that part yeah. answers your first question. And, and the second one, um, it, and it's very important, it's very interesting, uh, for decades the employees uh, argue with the central bank that if we, we did do something with the minimum wage, we will see inflation, unemployment, and of course there were some interest groups uh, against uh, changing the, 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 le le the minimum wage. And there were some resistance, of course, but the government was very, de very uh, determined to do it. And um, our Minister of Labor, um, she, uh, She's a woman and she did a great job like negotiating and imposing the, the determination of the government to do something about the minimum wage because it was ridiculous. For 30 years, the minimum wage was, um, was like not, not only not binding, but it was useless. And this policy, I think, has been uh, one, of the, one of the things that I'm more, more proud of, of the government actions in, in this administration to... to, to um, uh, re recover some, recover the value of the minimum wage as a, as a policy. So yeah. Follow up. Yeah. Follow up. Yeah. Yeah. So, but just on that question <coughs> of um, th if if you if you raise the minimum wage and you and, and prices don't rise for whatever reason, then there's obviously a squeeze on profits. Now maybe the profits were large enough anyway, and, and to you know to to kind of cushion that, but I. You know, would somehow kind of expect that you might see an impact on on uh, you know trade competitiveness. That on what? Yeah. On trade competitiveness. So, okay. exports being hit or imports rising. Well, that's that's interesting, and I don't know 
who, who, um, if someone here does uh, economic theory, what would be the intuition of, of increasing the minimum wage and you don't have any uh, effect on, on inflation or unemployment? Um, the, my intuition is that you have a monopsony. If you have a monopsony on, on, the, on the employees, uh, you may have that, that impact that uh, an increase, or that's the explanation that, that, I, that, I, that, I, that I have to the fact that you increase the minimum wage and you don't affect prices is because exactly, you have, may have a monopsony market uh, and um, some of the extra profits are like uh, a squeeze, of, as you said. Um, I, I haven't, we ha I, there is no evidence that we lost competitiveness in terms of our main uh, trade partners that the US and Canada, and, and we, we, don't, we haven't seen that. Thank you. Uh, David Fishman. Um, most of my question has already been <laughs> answered, but I would like to then focus on the informal sector. Yeah. So you say this is 40% of, of the labor force. And what measures have been, um, are being attempted by the government uh, to improve the, the conditions of that informal sector? Yeah. Yeah, the informality, I think, is one of the uh, structural and most persistent problems in uh, Latin American economies, not only in the Mexican uh, economy. And the problem of informality is uh, low productivity, the lack of access to social security, which means the lack of access to, to health services. Um, the strategy of, of this administration is, 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 is in two, two parts. First, um, lower all the administrative costs and lower uh, the and lower the administrative costs and uh, a special tax regime for small entrepreneurs and small business. That basically um, the tax burden is is the minimum uh, for for small entrepreneurs. That's um, still um, it's an open question if you if you um, don't tax a small business if they will move from the informal sector to the formal sector. But that's one, one part of the strategy. The other one is to provide universal coverage of health of in the health system. If you uh, eliminate the, uh, the of, of most of the countries, uh, only formal, formal, employ formal employment uh, have access to the health system. If you provide universal health uh, system, you uh, eliminate this cost of formality and informality. We started doing that in Mexico, but it's very expensive. So we haven't achieved like full coverage of uh, health or, or access to, to health. But that's, that's the, um, I would say that that's the, that we have to do, or that's the direction of the, of, of the p most uh, efficient policy to address informality, to provide universal coverage of health, and well, the pension um, for the elderly is, is one important measure. But if we, um, if we succeed in uh, provide universal coverage of social security, we basically will be eliminating this, this duality of formal and informal. Mm. But it's quite expensive mm. in terms of the public finance. So that's why we are like is in the right direction, but we haven't <laughs> get there, you know. Sorry, thank you, Francisco. Uh, we have, I think we have uh, Andrew. No, is Andrew? Yeah, Andrew first. Sorry, I didn't want to jump in ahead of Terry. <laughs> but, um, Andrew Sentence, Cambridge Econometrics, and former MPC member. Um, I would just like to ask both speakers um, about the issue about debt to GDP ratios for for public debt. Um, in my opinion, you're quite, both of you made comments that said, well, this is a very arbitrary sort of uh, figure and we don't really know where we should be on this sort of spectrum. 
Um, and I think that's quite correct. I mean, in the UK, for example, we've been between 30% of GDP in terms of public debt to 250% of GDP. And we've managed to survive without having any major defaults or anything like that. Um, so my, my sort of view of this is that it's the ability to service the debt, which is a combination of, you know, whether the government actually continues to pay the interest on the debt and the coherence of its economic policies that's much more important than any arbitrary level of um, the uh, public debt to GDP ratio. So I'd just be interested in your view whether you think you agree with that or whether you think there is some sort of other metric that we can look at uh, in terms of uh, how we assess uh, public debt to GDP ratios and that sort of thing. Shall I? Yeah, well, thanks, Andrew. I mean, uh, yeah, I agree, obviously, that uh, the debt GDP ratio appears to be uh, um, phenomenologically completely arbitrary. So is it Maastricht 60%? Is it uh, UK 100%? Is it Japan 265%? As you say, I mean, there doesn't seem to be any significant implication to the level at which it's set. So there's an arbitrariness both in policy and in terms of result. Um, in terms of the interest uh, payment financing of it, then I return to my view that uh, when the central bank is owning 40% of that debt and is owned by the government, then this is a closed circle. It's zero net debt both in terms of the principal and in terms of the interest payment. So furthermore, in my more radical proposal that we do enable uh, direct money financing of government expenditure, um, then of course that, uh, the interest payment wouldn't be there because it would no longer be defined as debt. So my question, therefore, to orthodoxy is if we take the present 100% of GDP, which is national debt, and at the time the expenditure was incurred over the last 20, 30 years uh, accumulating that debt, if we had not defined it as debt at that time, but simply as debt-free sovereign money, what would be the difference? Because the same amount of money would have gone into the resource economy, so presumably it wouldn't have caused any inflation because it would have been the same amount. Uh, the only difference would be that we wouldn't have the debt. It would mean, of course, that the uh, institutions like the pension funds and insurance companies would therefore be much more cash rich than they are now. Um, and the question then is, what would they do with the recycling of that? Would they, in fact, put it into corporate equities and fund uh, real industrial investment to better than it's funded at the moment? So those are secondary level questions. But, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, though I'm not sure whether you'd feel that I've answered the question about um, payment of the, of the interest. I think I have, but you may think I haven't. No. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you uh, something like happened to us in, in the Mexican government in, in the last uh, couple of months and has to do with my, with my, with my job. I, I participate on, on the um, framework of the economic budget each year. And this year, as you know, over the year we have to repay debt and issue new debt yes. uh, in, in, uh, and, and push the debt uh, far away in the horizon. And when we do that in a global economy where like central banks are tightening the, the monetary policy and the, and the financial system and we are seeing um, central banks fighting inflation, increasing interest rates, uh, for the Mexican budget, uh, the cost of the service of the debt uh, doubles for 2023. And what, that, what are the implications that we, uh, Initially, we were expecting uh, the service of the debt to be 0.5 percentage point of GDP. And because of the higher interest rate, it doubles to one percentage point of GDP. And in the order of magnitudes, like one percentage point of GDP is like one fifth of the social expenditure. So um, the service of the debt and the volatility of the interest rates, it's taking a tool on, 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 on our ability to expand, to, 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 to the expenditure side of the budget. So that's what we are very, uh, we take very seriously this um, trying not to increase the, the public debt because at the end of the day, 
it implies less expenditure on social programs, less investment on infrastructure, less investment of, of, of expanding the health system. So it's, it's, a, it's a big deal for us <laughs> to, to contain yeah. the debt, specifically because of the service. Yes, I can understand yeah. that. Yeah. Can I just abuse my role of chair and, and talk a little bit about Brazil? Because I think a variable here as well that comes in is the question of capital outflow um, and inflow. Because in, in Brazil, you have the inflation target regime in place. So what happens, regardless of what's happened to the debt, we know Brazil has one of the highest uh, interest rates uh, in the globe. So when you have the volatility in exchange rate because of mm -hmm. inflow outflow of capital, so we have to increase interest rates. And that takes away any kind of autonomy regarding macroeconomic policies and social policies. So I think that question for developing countries has to be related to you know, the integration mm -hmm. uh, that these countries they have in okay. international economy and the question of uh, capital control is still a big one, uh, I guess. Um, yeah, sorry, I know it was not. Is it related in a way, uh, I think? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Terry? Thank you very much. Um, well, I'd like to thank both speakers very much for very interesting talks. I mean, some of the best talks I've heard for a very long time. And I, 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 I was very interested in the contrast between the two, because you're a dreamer, <laughs> and you're a, applying economics, <laughs> and you're understanding an economy as it works. And yet there was some between them, because you're, as you said, the first democratic government in Mexico for a very long time, um, if ever. I think you said ever. I mean, since presumably the 1920s when you know, the dictator <laughs> was overthrown and the, 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 the constitution, the new constitution was uh, enacted. So um, now my question is, I have lots of questions <laughs> <laughs> about Mexico, but I, my question is really about uh, some of the things you said, particularly about work, because you had, you said about work, you said it as if it was negative, but people love to work. We're working now. I mean, I'm enjoying myself. I mean, <laughs> I don't know about others here, if you're working or not. I mean, this is interesting, right? And a, a lot of us, <coughs> nearly everybody, I think, most, some of the time, enjoys work. For one thing, it may be warmer at work at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> For another thing, I mean, you might hear gossip at work that you wouldn't hear at home. <laughs> and for another thing, some people like to get away from home into work. Yeah. And they love it. Um, and uh, let's face it, I mean, having a career or having a job that you love is one of the great joys of life Absolutely. and uh, yes hopefully. hopefully would you like to say something Brian <laughs> <laughs> well done, <Jerry. laughs> so my question to you is surely we've got to take into account that people want to work and get so much out of work I mean in terms of what does this does this mean something oh <laughs> an open safety pin <laughs> anyway um, is that a message? <laughs> so, you know, back to the, this is a major point. Yeah, it is. Because in um, neoclassic economics, which I think all of us know, work is treated as purely negative. Yeah. But it's not. Yeah. It's not. No, no, I agree. It's not. Yeah. And work and, it's, it's a question of work and life balance, isn't it? And we've only got 24 hours in the day, right? That's the constraint, isn't it? I mean, we all face that constraint and we have to sleep. Well, some of us don't sleep very much. Others sleep a lot. Um, but that's my point I'm Shall making. I, yeah. I mean, and, and I wonder if you agree with me. I do. And then... I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare not, but... <laughs> <laughs> but Sorry. Uh, sh shall I so, try yes, to respond no, to that? That's my question, yeah. really. Yes. No, I mean, I entirely agree with you. I, I would replace the word work by possibly the word creativity. You know, that we as human beings are creative. We want to be creative. We enjoy being creative. And we enjoy that creativity being in a social context, you know, i.e. with colleagues. 
Um, so, no, I'm not um, meaning to speak against work at all, but I am critical of the present work paradigm because it isn't generating the income that's necessary to all people. It's generating the income necessary to the top earners, but not to the people at the bottom of the income distribution. So there is a certain critique of it. And, of course, it also depends on what work you mean. I mean, if you're digging trenches out in the soil uh, for 12 hours a day, you, you might find that um, the marginal utility of that to yourself rather reduces. So... Yeah, you might enjoy it. You might enjoy it for a time, but when the rain pelts down and so on and so forth. So, you know, there are some work which will always feel slightly disutility yeah. to us. Other work which is very fulfilling because we, we achieve a solution, we uh, produce something other people enjoy, so there's a social element to it. And there's all, as you said, um, I mean, whether the temperature of the factory um, means that we can reduce wages, I don't know. But... Um, Yes, yeah, so there are benefits. I'm not arguing against work, but the data, of course, shows that working hours per week have reduced over the last 100 years. You know, there were 70 hours. It was a seven-day week. We come down to less hours. So what actual point do we want? And, and, and also, should the work be defined by another party? I, does it have to be employment where an employer is saying, this is what you will do? Um, and does the 8 to 4 factory in the 9 to 5 office, is that the right definition for us? Um, or are there other more flexible definitions that the technology is making available? If the technology is making a more comfortable work-life balance available, my friends who have retired, frankly, are very, very happy about yes. it. You know, they're, so they're sailing, they're photographing and so on. So Still socially. I then have a, a, a question for Frances. That is... Work in Mexico is very different from work in the United Kingdom. Because in Mexico, they have a lot of people on subsistence, more or less subsistence income. And they do work, and they work very hard, and they're not paid for it largely. And you are, we also, everywhere, we have people who are working at home who are also not paid. And that is all work. And my question to you is, how are you bringing those people into the market, the, um, the market, which they're not in the market, it's not marketed, yeah. or how, how are you managing it? Because this is central to your social yeah. program, it must be. Uh, can I add something to that? Sure. I'm enjoying my sure. role of uh, chair. And I think it goes back to David's uh, point on labor informality. Uh, you know, I, I think the one point for developing countries, and I don't know if you agree with me, is that, well, around the globe, like globally, we have over 60% of the labor is informal, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just, I mean, of course, it comes from the global south, but it's 60%. And I wonder, to go back to challenge the new thing, the, the, you know, challenge the orthodoxy, we always are terrorizing, especially in developing countries or global south countries, we start from the formality of labor, right? The, the formal labor market. And from there, we're trying to understand what's happening. But to me, when we have 60% of uh, the labor around the world being informal, and informal probably means precarious as well, yeah. it seems to me the starting point is wrong. The starting point shouldn't be the formality of labor to analyze this concept of informality. And it perhaps has a different, uh, trying to understand different relations between productivity and, and that type of work that actually is the majority of work around the world is not the exception. Uh, so, you know, it's not about just integrating these uh, laborers, these workers into the formality, but what is actual labor formality for countries in, in the global south especially? Uh, can we theorize in, um, the labor market that way? Okay. Well, thank you. Those are like very hard questions. And regarding the first one, I, I just will add that if you change this assumption of the utility function defined over the consumption good and leisure, and as you, you said, like maybe it's not um, the right approach. I don't know how many uh, standard results from the neoclassical model will you will you disregard or, or you change? I, yeah, like basically the, the whole the approach of labor markets, because from the utility on leisure you derive the supply of labor, and if basically you are like addressing a, a, a philosophical yeah. issue, yeah, I agree. And um, yeah, we have when when you look at uh, the labor markets in a country where 40% of the population 
is in, in below the poverty line, and when you have a supply of labor, if you allow me the word supply, um, that are ready to work and are willing to work for a wage that is probably lower than the, than than than, than they, they want a subsist subsistence wage, but they cannot find anyone to hire them. And you see in the streets of Mexico City, people uh, on the on the lights, street lights, like uh, so. Um, it's very hard to 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 design a, a, a labor market policies or economic policy to bring them to to work. Um, so that's why the the basic income is so important because you will give them uh, money that that money as I show is going to translate in consumption and then you stimulate the economy and maybe yeah. you may ha have uh, openings and like this cir circularity uh, but um, that's the direction that I guess we should work to to provide them with the means to consume and then uh, with the multiplier maybe get the uh, the opportunities for them to work for paid because the unpaid work is 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 also like half of the people work with, with no remuneration but uh, well my answer is it's so hard to answer your question <laughs> Um, this is so. This is so difficult. This this issue. I mean, we're addressing an issue which is basic to, you know, human survival. Actually, in the long term, if you think about it, because so many, so much so-called work is being done outside the formal sector everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just in Mexico. It happens mm -hmm. here, and we have the charitable sector, for example, which is outside the formal sector. We have people doing all sorts of things, you know, privately and helping people. Especially during COVID, we saw communities developing in this country during COVID, uh, which we hadn't seen since the war. Um, and actually, the period of COVID and the period now, and I say these words uh, emphasizing, we are in a wartime period. And the war that is being fought is a war of ideas and a war coming from Russia, which is actually a war against the West, against Western democracy and against Western values. I mean, deliberately funded in large amounts of fund going in in Russia to doing that through the internet. We know that, we know that, that what's going on. Uh, and when we come to look at work, and leisure and formal and not informal. The, the mo you talked about a new way of thinking and how, how we all work together. And of course, the new way of thinking, I would say this, is to do with the climate and the fact that we're all experiencing climate change. Mexico certainly is. I mean, the temperatures in Mexico, really shocking changes in the, in, in, in the weather in Mexico, as in the United States. And Snow, snowfalls in California, unprecedented, shocking, uh, and upsetting everybody. At the same time, there's a, you see, if you bring the monetary economy into the countryside, <coughs> what you're likely to do is have stimulate immigration, immigration and emigration. And then you have the problem of the huge populations around the big cities. And, and in a way, we need to bring back that policy, it's kind of how reverse it. How can people stay living where they are in the localities mm -hmm. with their families and encourage that and at the same time <laughs> prevent monetization and financialization? It's a major question. We've all got to address it. <coughs> Hold, I'm going to get, if you have any comments regarding these, I'm going to get one more question. Is there any other question before we close? Right. So there's there, that's it. Okay, so we get one more and then we, yeah. we close it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for two fascinating uh, presentations this morning. 
Well, one quick question for Francis, Francisco and, uh, and one for Jeff, if I may. Uh, Francisco, can, can, Francisco, can I just um, follow up the, there was a stream of questions really about the competitive, the, the effects of uh, higher minimum wage in, uh, in Mexico on competitiveness. Uh, could, could you tell us what the minimum wage is relative to the average manual wage in the US? Uh, and is it in the, uh, is it in the spectrum in, in which it's starting to affect foreign direct investment into Mexico from, say, the, the US and Canada in particular? Uh, and, and for Jeff, c could I just express a, a, a bit of skepticism about technological unemployment, um, which I think, in, in, I'm not sure if it completely drives the idea of basic income, but it's, it's, it's an important driver. I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about it. I mean, we, we haven't seen it. It's been talked about for 200 years and ne never quite arrived. At, but, but, but it may arrive now for, uh, for technical yeah. uh, for, uh, reasons of new technology. Um, but if there is uncertainty about it, is there the possibility, uh, and perhaps the, the more practical political possibility, of tackling this through the existing social security system rather than introducing a, a, you know, a whole new system? So that if people do start to become unemployed for technological reasons, unemployment starts to rise, that we, 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 we deal, that, deal yeah. with that through social security, which may need to be more generous, and taxes you know, okay. may need to rise as part of that. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, hold. There is one yeah. more question here. Yeah. Then, if you want to take, yeah. No, no. I just have to give the gentleman Aries. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we still hold then. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not being very disciplined. Great, Graham Gudgeon, uh, Centre for Business Research, which is just just across the road in Cambridge. Great. So I'm going to ask the speakers to address. Yeah. You know, if you want any comment to Terry as well, but also give us your final uh, remarks, and then we okay. can close this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I guess the, the answer to, to, to your question about the competitiveness is going to be an indirect answer that I just realized that uh, we, when the trade disruptions from, from, from COVID and, and the trade issues between the United States and China, one of the uh, main um, factors that are stimulating the Mexican economy is the, the, the nearshoring. Uh, several uh, firms and factories and, and suppliers that were installed in, in Asia are moving uh, and investing in Mexico. So um, if the minimum wage will be an obstacle or will be at levels that Mexico will lose in competitiveness, we wouldn't see this uh, massive in investment and this relocation of the value added change to Mexico. So that's maybe a evidence that the minimum wage is not binding on the minimum wage is not generating a, a, a damage to the competitiveness of the economy. We are seeing a lot of investment and relocation of firms from Asia to Mexico, and this being the, the engine of the, of the economy. As the engine of the economy has been the consumption, the private consumption, that presumably is the result of providing households with uh, cash transfers. But I guess that, that will be my answer, that the near shoring is evidence that uh, for a direct investment that, that we are on the right path. And the minimum wage was so low that with these increases, it's still not, it's not binding. And that will be my, my final comment. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Graeme, for your question too. I mean, my attempt at Nance would be that um, in microeconomics, there is technological unemployment. You know, in micro sectors, in micro examples, uh, which I've seen an abundance of in my consulting career, uh, the amount of labor going into output has massively reduced. I gave friends, uh, I went around a Fiat um, uh, engine factory down in the south of Italy, and it's producing 2,300 engine blocks a day with two people in the factory. So, you know, at the micro level, there is technological unemployment. But I know that, because we've discussed it before, your argument is therefore that at the macro level, um, there isn't technological unemployment because uh, technology, at the same time as it's changing the production function, is also inventing a whole range of new products and uh, services uh, that uh, uh, demand can uh, migrate to and, we, and employment can migrate to and we get increased uh, uh, growth. So my argument in any case is not that there is technological unemployment at the macro level. My argument is that there is technological uh, wage inadequacy 
um, at the macro level. So it is clear that, you know, we've got, f quotes, full employment, um, although some of it's precarious, blah, blah, blah. But we've got something close to full employment, but we have not got income adequacy. So I'm arguing in that there is technologically driven wage inadequacy um, or, or labour income inadequacy. So um, when you come to your second point about uh, why not use established welfare systems, well, because w once we admit that there is a need for non-labour income in society, uh, welfare benefits of some sort or another, the main art debate is between conditionality and universality. And I think that debate needs to be had more fulsomely than it has been at the moment, because the advocates for universality trash conditionality, and the advocates for conditionality trash universality. We need a slightly more grown-up debate. Um, but there are clearly uh, downsides to conditionality. I mean, it's costly to administer, it's intrusive, it becomes hostile, it's based upon the idea that everybody should get back to work and not be a scrounger. Therefore, it's not admitting the case for non-labour income. And, of course, uh, it has low take-up rates, particularly benefits for the elderly. Um, and ultimately, it does face the, uh, the tapers. Um, so, you know, you get an unemployment trap because if you take workers, you know, you lose benefit and you get a poverty trap as a result of that. Now, again, um, in Paul Johnson's uh, recent uh, hammer <laughs> blow of a book, um, he, as he says, the tapers have been reduced. They were 96% at one point, a uh, loss of income for you know, loss of benefit for any work you took, and they've been reduced under use of universal credit, he reckons, to about 70%, with the proposal that they go down to about 55%. Now, the other problem about that is that as you uh, reduce the tapers, of course, you then extend the benefit up the income range such that you get people on who are paying higher rates of tax actually also getting benefits. So, you, uh, the, you know, we need a debate about that, but in my view, conditionality um, has a lot of critique attached to it, and I would certainly argue in favour of um, an element of universality. Thank you. Please join me to thank uh, these two um, amazing presentations and a very stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have a break now, but please let's uh, get together here at 11.45 uh, for a more, discu more discussion on actually a basic income. Uh, thank you very much. See you soon.
Yeah, I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, I haven't really been asked that yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right? I guess not.
So welcome back from the coffee break. Um, and we're having our next session now for 90 minutes with two speakers. So the people, um, the people who don't know me, <laughs> my name is Anna Langakravi and I'm the chief executive and trustee uh, for the trust um, that is hosting the event here. And also, I had the honor to be a Darius PhD student, so we keep, you know, introducing ourselves now like true Terry. Um, and apparently, I think I was Terry's last PhD student. Um, nope. <laughs> you were planning to have more. <laughs> So we have two speakers now. I'll introduce Chris, Chris Sung, the uh, director of Cambridge Econometrics, who is going to speak about universal basic impacts, in, in, income, sorry, and the macroeconomic implications of it. So Chris is an economist specializing in evidence and analysis of, for public policy. His expertise covers a wide range of areas, including macroeconomics, labor markets, health, education, and equality and human rights, with experience uh, spanning research um, cons 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 consultancy, think tanks, and the public sector. As a director at Cambridge Econometrics, he has responsibility for the company's portfolio of work on social policy and uh, place covering topics including jobs, skills, inequality, and poverty. And uh, Chris is um, going to present now a study that was collaboration between the Trust and Cambridge Econometrics and um, was generally, generously uh, funded uh, by uh, Tono, who's also here in the room, and that is Jeff. And thank you, Jeff, for donating to the Trust. Thank you. And Chris, the floor is yours. Thanks, Anela. So you have uh, 25 minutes. Right, OK. I think that'll be fine. Um, well, thanks everyone, and I'm very glad to be here today. It's, uh, unfortunately, I can't stay for the whole day, but I'll, um, I'll get through this. Uh, um, so following on mainly from Jeff's session um, earlier, uh, I'll be talking about some work we did at Cambridge Econometrics looking at the macroeconomics of basic income. So in the context of the situation we're in right now, basic income is addressing the question of inadequate income, um, whether um, now in the short term or in the longer term when thinking about more, uh, more structural change. That's where, that's where we're focused on with this work. And in particular, we're interested in basic income as a systemic or structural reform as well. So that's, that's the undercurrent of this, thinking about what reforming an economic system, taxes and benefits might look like. So just, um, just as a little bit of background, um, interest in basic income is not it's not actually a new thing. I think we're either on the third or the fourth wave of intellectual interest in basic income. And right now, the, um, the, the factors that have spurred that have been concerns about growing inequality in the UK of the last 10 to 15 years, concerns about the nature of tax and benefits reforms, particularly in terms of the introduction of increased conditionality within the system. And also, longer term, as Jeff talked about earlier, questions about automation, to what extent will we need to move in time to maybe some kind of income replacement type system of which basic income is among the options that's been mooted. Um, basic income is hard to assess. There aren't too many cases around the world where it's straightforward to identify the impacts of basic income or basic income-like schemes and for various reasons, it's quite difficult to create, let's call them test tube conditions for assessing basic income. So there are small scale studies, there are a few pilots also running at the moment as well, but the evidence base is still relatively, relatively, um, relatively underdeveloped. So most of the research tends to be modeling. It tends to be looking at situations, running scenarios, what if sorts of conditions to examine how the world might look differently under different schemes. And most of that work in the UK has tended to be um, on distributional concerns. So it's tended to look at uh, what we'd normally think of as the microeconomic conditions. So what happens if you take data on households as they currently are? What happens if you shift benefits and tax structures around before and after to understand for example, what a, 
a two-person, two-owner family with two children, um, what their economic circumstances would look like before or after a change in basic income. That tends to be the research focus. Um, and what that tends to show is by re-engineering the tax and benefit structure in those sorts of ways, there are ways to redistribute income in, um, in various ways of um, varying degrees of progressivity, but it tends to be a static analysis. So it doesn't tell you much more than that. It tells you what happens when you move money um, into people's pockets, between people's pockets, but not much of what follows. And many of the criticisms that follow from basic income tend to be on the steps that follow that. So does it reduce the incentive to work? Do people withdraw from the workforce? Might it be putting money in pockets that just generates inflation? Those are the sorts of questions that are not normally answered by analyses that shift income around through tax and benefits policies. And this is the second point here. Macroeconomic dynamics don't tend to be explored quite so much. So what happens when you've put the money in lower income households pockets, for example? What is the role of the funding mechanism? And as I'll get to, this starts to become very important. There's a lot of discourse at the moment about basic income as a payment, the amount of money that's transferred to households. But actually what matters is the basic income scheme. It's the payment, but also the mechanisms by which the payment is funded. Um, and those, certainly in macroeconomic terms, can have their own effects as well. So it's basic income schemes that matter, not just the value of the payment itself. And while um, these aren't the only metrics that we should be concerned about, in terms of the exercise that we carried out here, we were interested in what happens if you look at these effects through conventional economic metrics as well. What does it mean for GDP? What does it mean for employment? What does it mean for prices? Um, and the main channels that make this different to the existing analysis is understanding those income and expenditure effects and also how they compare to the labour supply effect. So what, what happens to the incentives to work if people are given an unconditional payment to supplement or replace their income? That is relevant in both supply and demand terms and in a macroeconomic analysis we're interested in understanding both of those. So as I said, most, um, most analyses of these types are going to involve some kind of computer model. We're talking about what-if analysis, we're talking about scenarios, and for this, um, in our case, we maintain a macroeconometric model for policy analysis, E3ME, and what I'll be taking you through is comparisons between a baseline case, so what if the world continues more or less on business as usual trends, and then we'll compare that to cases in which we implement the basic income policies of different types, and we see where we end up in terms of GDP, employment and prices. Um, I don't want to make this overly technical, but it's also important when you think about an economic analysis, what model or what theories you're drawing on in order to view the world. This was the point earlier about to what extent do the evidence overturn or not, neoclassical hypotheses or the like. So how you think about the economy, how you think it works is very relevant to this. And in this regard, E3ME is sectorally disaggregated, which is important once we start thinking about automation and the extent to which jobs might or might not be lost through technological change. It's an econometric model, so we're using statistics to identify behaviours based on past experience, and it falls within a post-Keynesian economic theoretical paradigm with, crucially, no presumption that the economy tends to full capacity by itself. And so through that, we, um, we had took two lines of inquiry. One was to try and extend thinking on existing basic income schemes, which tend to be relatively small in nature because they tend to be looking at reforms that remain fiscally neutral, and that's, that's the policy space at the moment. So this is basic income for effectively the now. And then looking further ahead, if we were, for example, to extend Jeff's hypothesis from before about automation leading to widespread technological unemployment, what do larger basic income schemes, and in this case funded by debt-free sovereign money, what do they look like in the longer term? So we're, we're looking at this through two lenses, through uh, two, I suppose, different time periods, if you want to think of it that way. So what you see here is 
indicative of the kind of scheme that's been proposed in the UK previously. And as schemes that tend to be fiscally neutral, the idea is as far as possible to provide levels of payment that would be recognisable to current benefits recipients. So this schedule of payments was, I think, valid in 2019, and this is the, the structure of the payment in terms of basic income that, um, that we modelled with smaller payments available to young people, those of working age get a bit more, and those um, of retirement age effectively having their pension either you know, being replaced by the basic income. And so that's the basic income payment, but as far as the scheme, and particularly in order to have fiscal neutrality, um, there needs to be a funding mechanism and the typical way to do this in uh, the UK proposed schemes is to adjust taxes and benefits to compensate for that. To broadly speaking, maintain fiscal neutrality by reducing other benefits, which are now replaced by the basic income, and raising taxes, typically income tax, but we also examined um, taxes on, on firms as well. And those, those have two different effects, as it turns out. And we also examined at this small scale case um, a universal payment fa uh, funded by debt free sovereign money of a scale similar to what was implied by pandemic support to households during the, um, during the COVID-19 uh, period. Um, I, sorry, I should also say that as well as modelling those payments, we did uh, capture the reduced incentives to work that might arise from paying paying people unconditionally. And where we ended up um, was here. So in reading this chart, if a scheme had no effect at all, there would be a flat line running at 0% right along the bottom there. That would say that whatever scheme that we'd examined had had no impact on GDP, whereas with the red line marked redistribution, which was the typical case of funding a basic income by withdrawing certain benefits and raising taxes, we end up with GDP that is slightly higher in our scenario than compared to the baseline, but it's really only slightly higher. That's half a percent by 2035. And at that sort of scale, I would normally be telling you that the impact of uh, that basic income on GDP is effectively neutral at that point. It's, um, it looks positive from the modelling results, but it's not of a size that would be easily discernible to you in 12 years' time. So GDP impacts are neutral. You get a slightly more spending, but you also get slightly more jobs through that because the spending is higher, economic activity is higher. And what we're seeing here is despite the slightly reduced incentive to work, the redistribution, which is progressive, it puts more money in the pockets of lower income households, generates slightly more economic activity, and that's propping up um, actually slightly increasing employment. And the DFSM case, the um, sovereign money approach, which is injecting new money rather than redistributing income between households, that's, um, that has a slightly higher effect, but again, I would interpret that as neutral or you know, not obviously negative in terms of typical um, economic metrics. And in these cases, I haven't actually shown it, but inflation tends to be quite mild because at, this, at these sorts of levels of increase, uh, slack in the economy is still being taken up. So increased spending is being absorbed by the excess capacity in the system at this point. Although that scheme design does matter because you tend to get more inflation if you start putting the taxes on the firms than if you um, raise the income taxes on households because that tends to lead to at least some degree of cost price pass through. But in both cases it's mild, but it does tell us that the scheme design starts to matter in macroeconomic terms. So moving through to, um, to a more, should we say more dramatic case then, we now start to think about automation, so basic income in the longer term. And here we are, we are constructing a future in which higher productivity automation can displace workers. So we're not, we're not arguing that it's more or less likely, but we're examining this scenario in order to see the role of a basic income in addressing a future like this if it were to come to pass. So for this, we have 
information that um, was taken from various PwC reports about the potential scale of job losses over the period. We modelled that and compared the impacts of the automation to a situation in which we still had the automation, but we raised basic income to try and return household incomes back to the original baseline levels. And in the model that we have, that scale of automation, that level of displacement of jobs can be quite adverse because while it improves productivity and the productive capacity <coughs> in the economy, by shifting money away from households because they're not gaining in terms of income, it's, um, it's money that's accruing through profits through to capital, um, that creates a situation of deficient demand in the economy. So households have less income, they spend less, and so while the economy could produce more, there's a lack of effective demand to maintain GDP at its original levels, but the basic income is able to fill that gap in this case. Um, again, with comparatively mild inflationary effects because there remains capacity in the system to absorb that extra demand. So um, the small scale of the inflation at this point is hopefully uh, visible here in terms of the, um, the impacts from the green and the blue line, which are the small scale schemes, but also the way in which higher productivity can, compared to baseline, can, um, can reduce uh, price increases with actually automation having the bigger impact on inflation in those scenarios than the compensating effect of the, um, of the basic income. So um, in both of these cases, the schemes that we've modelled and the adjustments we've applied to the funding mechanisms don't obviously lead to the kind of high inflation that was feared or has been, has been cast doubt about when people are talking about basic income in isolation. Uh, just quickly on what we can and can't say about these results, um, as, as an economy moves to um, an unconditional payment, it's unclear from historical experience what that might do to wage bargaining. So does that mean that people will be better equipped to walk away from bad job offers, or does that mean that firms will start treating that as wages they don't have to pay to their employers? There's not a huge amount of evidence there, so there's some uncertainty as to how that might, how that might play out, what that might do to the results. We, um, we say here no explicit assessment of exchange rate effects, but more broadly speaking, we're not modeling in any great detail financial mechanisms that might underpin some of these effects. But insofar as we're not seeing huge amounts of inflation, there's not obviously an inflation case for interest rates to change and therefore through that channel, we might not think that exchange rates might change too much. And in broader terms, because we've been looking at macroeconomic metrics only, we haven't really looked at the role of education and training in driving future productivity. And certainly in terms of the schemes that have been assessed in the real world, workforce withdrawal in order to invest in education and training is one of the known effects of some of these cash transfers. So the longer term productivity gains are not captured here nor are the impacts on health and well-being from having an unconditional basic income versus the conditionality that's currently um, attached to most benefits. So in conclusion, at the small scale, there are not any obvious adverse effects for an economy operating below capacity um, of a basic income. A progressive redistribution of income tends to increase GDP slightly, or you know, I would tell you that it's neutral. Um, it seems to um, draw in an ex a little bit more employment, depending on how positive you interpret that effect. And that impact comes despite a weakened incentive to work at a microeconomic level for households, which is an effect that in, in situating this would seem to be consistent with what's coming out of assessment of the Alaska Permanent Fund. The Alaska Permanent Fund is, uh, is a wealth fund based on all revenues in Alaska with a dividend paid to citizens in the state 
depending on the returns each year. And similar effects were posited from evaluations of that scheme in which there, were, uh, there was evidence that there was withdrawal from the labour market, particularly in the switch to slightly more part-time work, but at the same time, employment output outcomes seem to be sustained with the thinking that this came about from the income, the multiplier effects that follow from the basic income itself. So that's at the moment how we're situating, situating the work, how we're understanding it. And in the automation case, in a future that we have modelled that erodes household income leading to deficient demand, um, the basic income scheme that we've modelled appears able to sustain household incomes without, again, adverse impacts on the macroeconomic indicators that we've been looking at. With this result resting on the idea that, structurally speaking, we don't think that the economy will tend to full capacity um, by itself. Now, as a structural, as a systemic reform, that seems like, um, like quite a comforting outcome if you're interested in the macroeconomic impacts of a basic income. But of course, we are in a high inflation situation right now. So structurally, the results here would seem to support that. But when I talked before about basic income scheme design, I think for this to be applicable right now, there remain questions about policy package design as well, because the basic income by itself is not necessarily going to do anything other than deal with the ina inadequate income. But what we haven't really examined here, what was not the point of the exercise was understanding um, policies that might be effective in an inflationary environment as well. So um, while we haven't studied it, I think what this points to is, or at least it underlines, is the importance of the wider policy package, even if basic income looks to be an effective policy to address inadequate income. Um, so I'll stop there, and hopefully I've done okay for time, but um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, are there any questions of clarification um, before we move on to our next presentation? Yeah, there's one. Thank you. I mean, just at the present inflation you've spoken about, I mean, uh, wouldn't you agree that's uh, the result of an exogenous um, shock? I mean, it's uh, a, a global inflation. It's rather similar to the OPEC 1970s exogenous shock. It's not due to excess demand. Uh, I, th I think I would. I think in terms of... Um, sorry, stand on. Um, yes, yes, I think, I, I think that's right. And because of that, I think the structural case for basic income would be supported by these model results. But as far as how it might interact with the current situation, I think that, that still means that attention needs to be placed on other parts of the policy package. Thank you. Yeah, there's one more quick question. We'll have a... Uh, we'll take an another presentation presentation and then we'll have a discussion so we will have more time later but now please um two, two questions really uh sorry um my name is Anne Gray and I'm from the Citizens Basic Income Trust um when I read your paper I started thinking about um in what sectors automation takes place and if automation takes place in some sector that sells most of its output overseas um, then you would expect that the effect on job creation or job loss in the um, local, uh, you know, the national economy where the basic income scheme is happening um, would be minimal. Um, so, I mean, that, that's one question I think to consider, you know, how far um, the current output of British industry is output, is, uh, sorry, is export oriented um, and, you know, what effects that might have. Um, and in particular, th those sectors which are most likely to automate, like, for example, car production, um, one assumes are still very um, export-oriented. Um, the other thing which perhaps is a sort of line for further research rather than uh, a comment on your paper specifically is, um, if a government was in power that was likely to introduce a widespread or a national basic income scheme, um, it would surely be investing in loads of other things on the left side of the political spectrum as well. And those are likely to include a vast expansion of public services, which are notoriously difficult to automate. So that might have effects on the um, job creation 
uh, and job loss effects of automation. So I just think that that's something worth to consider. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, I completely agree with that. And how I suppose macroeconomic research on basic income, I think, remains relatively underexplored. Macroeconomic research on basic income as part of a package of other policies, I'm not sure I've seen anything on that so far. So I think that's, I think that's very relevant. And I, um, I, th I think I will have to withhold judgment on the first one because the wage bargaining effect and some of these other um, some of these other factors start to come into question as to how basic income could in principle affect the competitiveness of different um, UK industries and um, I don't think I have at the moment a view as to which way some of those things would go but I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting point. So thank you Chris and please allow me, need to in me now to introduce our next speaker and our next speaker is Joe Crisp and he's a research associate at the Institute for uh, Policy Research, University of Bath. And his research interests include uh, political economy, comparative politics, labor markets, welfare states, and basic income. Um, Joe has a doctorate from the University of Bath. And he's also been working at the University of Bergen as a postdoc, and he also uh, BA in philosophy, politics, and economics from the University of Oxford. Um, so Joe will move now to more to micro uh, level and political economy level, level, but continues exploring uh, universal basic income. And uh, the big question is: we can observe the declining labour shares. Whether these relate, relate actually to technological change. Um, this is one question, and whether the second question really is whether we can um, use UBI to address this problem, and it will also look at um, interconnected relationship of households that. So the floor is yours, Jeff. Thank you very much, and thanks very much for inviting me to speak here. I'm very pleased uh, to be here. So um, even though it's part of a panel about basic income, really basic income is uh, I'm going to come to that very much at the end and very much as a discussion point rather than a core part of what the paper is trying to, to uh, discuss and, and to, to analyse. Uh, and the focus of this paper really is uh, looking at what Jeff's argument was in the earlier presentation, the extent to which technology is driving uh, a decline in the labour share and particularly uh, two questions that we really wanted to explore in this was um, different types of ways that we imagine what technology is and I think <laughs> probably most people in the room will understand how difficult it is to con both conceptualise and measure technology and so how, d how do we prove that technology is having a particular effect on, on things such as the labour share but also the variation across countries. And, and in this paper, we've tried to utilise the idea of growth regimes um, and the um, political economy of institutions and uh, both the supply side and the demand side. And to link to what uh, Anne just asked about the exports uh, intensity of different countries, what is the consequence of having a particular focus on uh, exports within the country versus a kind of consumption-based economy and we, we both use this growth regime framework for analysing the data on technology's effect on the labour share but also for discussing the extent to which we think basic income or policies to stimulate consumption might serve a particular function in different uh, country contexts. Uh, well I've just <laughs> explained the motivation there uh, without, without the, the uh, slide there but anyway so um, the basic picture in, in the long term since the 1970s uh, has been a decline across, so this is an unweighted mean of OECD countries uh, in the aggregate labour share, and we've seen a decline of about 10% from uh, the, the late 70s, uh, although there's been something of a plateau since the financial crisis. Um, now, one thing that's important to, to, to emphasise is that whilst at the aggregate this has certainly been the case, uh, different uh, countries have seen different trends and particularly as we're in the UK I think it's important to state that since the late 90s there's actually been an increase in the labour share in the UK and so 
you know, <laughs> even just starting from this point about, you know, what, what, what do, how do we understand uh, these trends, I think it's uh, important to, to emphasise the country context. Of course, Ireland there is, uh, nobody can trust Irish GDP figures, so that's <laughs> a large part of what's driving the decline in the, the labour share there. But, but <laughs> it's a fictional <laughs> GDP figures. Uh, and, um, but the, the point I'm trying to make there is whilst, you know, the big picture is a decline in the labour share, um, really, uh, often it depends on the, uh, the, the country that we're talking about. And uh, I think it's very notable that the UK has seen uh, an increase in the labour share since the, uh, the late 90s. So anyway, at, at the aggregate level, what has been driving this and there are many kind of big broad theories about uh, what that might be. Some say uh, globalization, whether, whether that's trade liberalization or uh, and capital openness or offshoring of labor intensive uh, activities. Is it specifically the kind of liberalization of financial markets or the liberalization of, of labor markets, which in turn affect the bargaining power of labor being an, uh, an obvious uh, explanation or market concentration, so that if you like, the, the power of, of, of particular uh, corporations to drive drive down uh, the, the labour share. Some have argued that this is really a demographics story, and the labour share kind of there's a pressure on the labour share to decline as the the um, percentage of the population that is active uh, declines. Um, but in this paper, we're going to look at the idea that um, technological change is uh, partly responsible for that. And there's been a number of different ways of, of, of um, operationalizing this idea of technological change. And we explore uh, a few in this, in this paper. So it's important to say that, in a sense, all of the things that we measure and we look at and we use for this study are effectively proxies for technology. You know, they're, they're not, you cannot get to the, to the, to the absolute, um, I have, I remain unconvinced that anyone has, has <laughs> developed a measure that accurately uh, measures exactly what we mean by the concept of technology. But this, this is um, some proxies that, that, that come out of other literature that we've, we've tried to use um, to analyze uh, the effect. And as you can see, uh, so one of those is the relative price of investment goods to consumption goods, which um, is assumed by many people to decline as um, economies become more technology technologically advanced. And you can see in this uh, paper here, uh, since the uh, 1970s, there's been a, a very uh, rapid decline in the relative price of investment goods to consumption goods. As the capital intensity, so the, the percentage of uh, the capital stock as a percentage of uh, gross value added or GDP. But we also try and look at some of the kind of more uh, things that are specific to our economy in recent years. So the percentage of ICT capital was a percentage of uh, value added and also software capital tying into some of the discussion of uh, intangible, intangible, the intangible economy that, that people have been uh, discussing. So within our uh, uh, dynamic OLS regressions and uh, we use time and country fixed effects. Um, we also uh, control for the other factors that I mentioned here. So uh, trade openness, financial integration, union density, and the age dependency uh, ratio. Uh, and so what we find is, at least if we think about uh, the, the capital intensity, so uh, I should have made it clearer there, but our two measures there, the capital ratio and the capital intensity, um, those are actually both capital intensity, but they're measuring uh, either at the country level or at the, the, the sectoral level. Um, but both of them, as the level of cap capital intensity uh, increases, we might expect a decline in the labour share. And equally, with the relative uh, investment price, um, as it decreases, we also see a decrease uh, in, in the labour share. But we didn't find any significant effects uh, for software capital or ICT capital specifically. Um, we also tried to, to look at the, the, the effect of technology on, on skill level and particularly thinking about the, the, uh, the debate between whether it's hollowing, that there's a hollowing out of the middle uh, with mid-skilled sectors or it's a kind of uh, skill bias technological change effect. And surprisingly, uh, we saw more evidence for the skill bias technological change because a lot of other uh, 
recent research has, has found much more evidence for the, for the hollowing out of the middle. Uh, so we find that the increase in the, uh, the decrease in the relative price of investment goods leads to an increase both in the mid-skilled labour share and also the high-skilled labour share with a de decrease in the low-skilled uh, labour share. Uh, there's less effect of capital intensity, uh, but um, there does seem to be, at least uh, in the capital intensity uh, uh, analysis, a kind of uh, a decrease in the uh, mid-skilled um, labour share. Um, but we found that for ICT intensity, there's a, uh, uh, a decrease in the um, low-skilled labour share, whereas increases in the mid-skilled and the high-skilled uh, labour share. Okay, so we also wanted to, to think about uh, the divergence of, 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 of capitalisms and the importance of institutions, but also um, a different emphasis on explanatory factors and, and the possibility of change or, or reforms to, to social policies and also um, to, uh, to think about what, what options there are for reforming uh, the effect in which technology impacts upon our labour markets and, and so on. And so we're drawing on a kind of uh, a long-standing uh, tradition of thinking about div uh, divergence in, in capitalisms, whether that's focusing on uh, the electoral or the class coalitions involved in, in different uh, economies, or focusing more on the producer groups or the supply side, or a more recent approach which is focused on uh, the demand side, and so the kind of focus on to what extent does uh, the, the type of demand in the economy affect the, the, the shape and the supply um, uh, of, of, of a different institution. So it's not just a firm-based explanation for, for, for trends within the economy, but also whether consumption or exports uh, or increases in, in, in wages are driving that. And um, we follow the kind of holistic approach that Hassel and Pallier take, which, which kind of incorporate all of these things into forming their uh, growth regimes, uh, which you can see here. I won't go into too much detail, but effectively arguing that... Um, whether what the demand driver of, uh, of growth is, is an important part of the story, as well as the level of financialization, uh, The extent to which the knowledge economy or the ICT sector is an important part may affect uh, the effect of technology on, on, on the, on the labour share. Um, also the educational system and also the system of, of wage setting and social protection. So all of these institutional factors may have some effect on the way that technology affects um, everything within the economy, but in our study, particularly the, the effect of technology on the labour share. Uh, and so, as you can see here, we, we find that whilst um, the relative price of investment goods has, uh, when, when, when there's a decline in the relative price of investment goods, we see a decline in the labour share uh, as a whole. Uh, there's a difference uh, depending on, 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 the, uh, on the countries that we include in our sample. So for uh, what we call the publicly financed um, growth regime, which is, for the most part, uh, uh, kind of southern European countries, um, an increase, a uh, decrease in the relative price of investment goods has a very high effect uh, on reduction in the, in the labour share, whereas uh, the effect is much smaller in high-tech manufacturing countries like Germany and Aust Austria and so on, whereas the effect uh, is actually, well, I mean, it's insignificant in, in, in Nordic countries. Uh, we actually find, uh, we in one thing I didn't uh, describe there is we also had a quick look at um, the relative price of ICT investment goods, uh, and there we find the, the, the opposite effect. So in, in Nordic countries, there is a decline in, in, in the labour share with a uh, decrease in the relative price of investment goods, ICT investment goods, but not in the case for, for high-tech manufacturing growth regime. Uh, okay, so what is the significance of... Uh, the falling labour share. If we assume that, um, if we assume that uh, there is has been this secular decline in in, in the labour share and technological change is at least in some part driving uh, driving that decline in the labour share. What is the significance? So so a key part obviously is that uh, wealthier people, uh, richer people, tend to <laughs> own more of their, their their income through through shares and capital rather than labour. So the more and more income that is given to capital rather than labour, the more you might expect to see increases in inequality. Uh, and so there's questions about uh, distributive justice. 
There's also potential issues related to inequality um, to do with uh, threats to democratic politics and perhaps the, this kind of pressure on wages is causing some of the, the difficulties we've had with uh, democracy in, in recent years. But the thing that we uh, w wanted to, to discuss in this paper mostly was, was the potential for a kind of deficient aggregate income or demand um, which may have some effect on increases in, in household debt, uh, as Jeff mentioned before. As you can see, um, we, we didn't have, we don't include here, uh, there isn't data for all OECD countries going back before 1995, uh, so we can't see a longer term trend here, um, but certainly since 1995, as well as a decline in the labour share, we've also seen a decline in gross disposable income uh, affordable to houses, uh, households. So whilst labour income is decreasing, we're also not seeing that replaced at the moment at the level of households on average. Again, country variation is very important here, but if we take the average of OECD countries, gross disposable income for households is also declining. So there may be some issue of deficient uh, aggregate income uh, or, or demand. Uh, and if we look at household debt, and we've divided this uh, in terms of growth regimes here, so um, you can see that, um, well, actually, the, the, the highest levels of, of household debt have been in, in Nordic countries, um, but effectively, the, whilst the uh, levels are different, the patterns are very similar, except in the high-tech manufacturing countries, which often don't have a very high uh, fina financialized system. But effectively, household debt increased very much up until the financial crisis and then has plateaued or, uh, since then. Um, and uh, whilst there are many uh, studies that look at what precisely drives household debt, and many focus on, for example, Real, the most robust kind of predictor of increases in household debt seems to be real residential house prices. So we may say that really what's driving this debt is, the, if you like, the supply, <laughs> the ability to, uh, to borrow. Um, but that doesn't necessarily say that at least at the structural level there is some necessity for that debt to be formed to replace, to replace income. So, so there is a potential that whilst, whilst we may not... Um, be able to link necessarily the, the decline um, of, of income to, to increases in debt. There may be a kind of structural uh, reason why, why this is happening related to uh, deficient, deficient income. So um, a lot of, as um, Chris, who I, I, I guess has left, um, mentioned a lot of the debate around UBI has been kind of really about social policy questions about conditionality uh, and so on, uh, which I won't touch on too much, too, too much here, but another part has been really on this micro macroeconomic argument that, that it, it can provide a kind of Keynesian uh, demand stimulus, if you like. Uh, and Jeff in particular um, argues that um, high technology economies in particular um, see a, a falling uh, labour share, wage share, uh, which is currently being either um, uh, kind of countered by benefits uh, or debt. So can a basic income replace those benefits or debt in a more effective way? So just uh, three kind of ways of structuring this debate that I thought might be helpful um, is to think about why we might say that that's not the case. What would the opposition to UBI be? And I, I, I think of this in kind of three different steps. The first is to focus on the means. So if if we agree that basic income would be a great thing, one of the reasons we might think that it's not the solution to, to our problems is because of the way of funding it uh, is not appropriate or in, inadequate in lots of ways. So whether that is increasing taxes on income, which some people um, often model with uh, social policy, and so whilst it may be the case that we can reduce marginal effective tax rates for some people on, on low benefits by kind of introducing a basic income, obviously we're just recycling those marginal effective tax rates to, to somebody else. So in a sense, uh, the, the case against using income tax um, is argued on its own terms. So when we're arguing against UBI, really we're arguing about different ways of structuring income tax. And um, 
if that's your way of funding UBI, then a lot of the debate is going to be focused on the benefits <laughs> of introducing those kind of tax reforms or not. And clearly, if we want to fund it through sovereign money or, or um, direct financing of a, a UBI from a central bank, a lot of the debate is really going to be about what the effect of that direct financing is on prices and, 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 and the rest. So, so we may focus our uh, debate around the means. What is the way that we might fund a, a UBI? And what would be the consequences of, of that method of, of, of funding it? The second way of thinking about uh, the opposition is the opportunity cost. So let's say we can direct finance government spending. We've got 100 billion to stimulate <laughs> the economy in some way that, we, that won't increase inflation. What are all the other things that we could potentially spend that money on instead of giving a direct cash benefit? And what would the consequences of those things uh, be? And clearly, a lot of people opposed to UBI are not necessarily against the, 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 the ideas or the principles, but think that providing benefits in kind through social investment, housing, um, you know, childcare, social care, all of those ways which would equally stimulate the economy through providing wages for people and, and so on, would be a better use of whatever the means <laughs> that we've decided to fund the UBI, there is still an opportunity cost there that we need to think about. So we may decide that the economy, the technology is driving down the labour share and that we need some mechanism to, to, to stimulate uh, the economy that doesn't necessarily have to be a UBI, it doesn't, doesn't have to be... Uh, services as opposed to UBI, but also, as Graham mentioned earlier, it could just be within the existing benefit system. So, you know, it, we could double the standard allowance in, in universal credit, and we would see a huge stimulus uh, from, from that. Would that not be a simpler, more politically feasible way of doing the, the things that we need to do to prevent uh, some kind of aggregate income deficit? The third thing, of course, is to, to contest the entire premise of, of this paper, which is that there is nothing we can do to stop technology reducing uh, the, the labour share. And there's nothing that we can do with our institutions or with our politics to prevent this from happening. And, and I think that's also a strong um, debate that needs to be had because I, I, I think, you know, clearly there has, even at the, whilst at the aggregate level, there's been a decline in the labour share. Um, there are variations across, across countries with different labour market institutions. And also, if the problem is um, that too much, if we accept the argument that too much income is going to capital, should we not be trying to <laughs> grab some of that capital income to, 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 to provide for people rather than just um, uh, kind of counter the aftereffect? So is, is basic income effectively throwing up our hands and surrendering any kind of attempt to structurally change our economy. So I think that's another important uh, debate to have. And just thinking about uh, growth regimes again, in the um, Cambridge Econometrics model you just saw before, it's focused in the UK, which is a very consumption-driven economy, where uh, household consumption-driven economy, where clearly a demand stimulus of the type of a basic income is going to have positive uh, effects on the economy. To what extent does that apply in export uh, orientated uh, economies? I think that's also an important thing to consider when we have a kind of broader debate about, if you like, stripping out the, the context and the, um, the important um, factors within actual na national economies uh, for thinking about whether a basic income uh, is a good solution. Uh, so that's all I have uh, for today. Thank you very much. Uh, for listening. I guess with Chris gone, I'm going to have to be fielding all the questions. Uh. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very much, Joe. Um, yeah, Chris, Chris had, had to leave, unfortunately, and he asked me to pass on his apologies. But um, we have also Professor Nick Pierce here, and I'm just asking him to maybe move up here and join the discussion. And he was a co-author of the study we just, was just presented. Yeah. So then he's yeah, yeah. going to support you. <laughs> yeah, he provides moral <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, any questions? Any? Yes, Andrew. 
Sorry, Andrew Sentence. Um, I just, I'm quite sceptical about the general notion that we're in this great technological wave that we haven't seen before. If you look at, I mean, it would have been quite interesting to look at labour share over 200 years, mm -hmm. you know, going back to the Industrial Revolution and really to get a sense of perspective when we've seen other big technological shifts. And um, the thing about the current wave of technology is it's very visible to everybody through information and communications technology. But most of the time, um, since the Industrial Revolution, technology has been changing things in factories, out of people's sort of normal experience. And so we think we're in this amazing wave of new technology, but I don't think we are. Um, if you think about you know, revolutions in transport, in electricity, and all sorts of other you know, innovations that have taken place since the Industrial Revolution, I think it's a great myth <laughs> that we're, we're in this you know, new technological age because we've seen you know, previous waves of technology that have been quite significant. So I, it, it would have been interesting for you to look at the labour share mm -hmm. over a much longer period um, I also don't trust the data when it comes to the labour share. Mm. Um, sorry to be a, a total sceptic here, no, but no. Um, when I've looked at the UK data, for example, they lump together self-employment and other forms of income uh, together. And if self-employment is increasing, uh, I'm not sure that's captured in the labour share, but you can contradict me on that and say it, it's all properly captured. So... Um, uh, I'm just a little bit sceptical about the sort of database that you're working from. Yeah. Um, so I'll take that in, I guess, two, two parts. The first, which is the general question about uh, whether we're living in a new uh, technological age. I mean, I personally agree with you that I don't think we're in a new technological age necessarily. And also, I think it's quite interesting that the, the ways that when we try to measure if you like, what is new? So ICT capital is a share of, of, of uh, gross value added or, or GDP or software capital, which are these kind of, if you like, a step change from the different types of technology that we might have had. There doesn't seem to be an effect on, on, on the labour share. So it's the more general kind of proxies that we had that seem to have an effect. But as you say, if you look at the long term, and unfortunately we only have data for certain countries, which is why we didn't include it in this, in this study, but the US, you know, there was clearly a lot of technological change between 1900 and 1970, but in that period, the labour share <laughs> increased <laughs> rather than decreasing. So there's, there's clearly not a fundamental sense in which technological change, however we conceive it, will drive down the labour share. But just within our study that we, we found that since the, the 1970s, uh, there has been um, this effect from the proxies that we've used in this study. So I, I very much... I'm agnostic about the, the fundamental pre the, the argument of the paper. I, just the, the way that we've measured it and the way that we've studied it in this uh, suggests that there, there is, there is a, a relationship between, between the two. Um, and the second part of the question was about the me measurement of it. Yeah, so, so it does include, so that there are, you know, it's obviously a huge part of the, the measurement of the labour share is working out what to do with mixed income or self-employment self income. And all of these will include, um, will include a way of dealing with uh, mixed income, uh, which is to, to try and avoid the extent to which the balance between employed, employees and, and self-employment is. So, so um, uh, I'm not actually 100% sure uh, which which of the different methods we've, we've, we've got in this one, but yeah. But the trust the OECD, which is where you put your data from, you use the trust the OECD. Uh, you, you, I think a, lot, a lot of it is from um, Amico as well, though, as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. It's the yeah. EU. But Nick, would you like to add anything? Or? No, I, I just think that, I mean, the point about, um, I suppose the point you raised, Andrew, about uh, technological change having produced, um, you know, significant innovation and so having been contained in factories is then you might expect the channel for the labour share to be about how technology affects the organisation of labour power and the ability of labour to 
track. Yeah. Uh, uh, higher wages. And as technology changes such that factories are no longer passing uh, labor power in the same way, and, and, uh, uh, and that labor is disorganized, um, and technology facilitates that disorganization, that that may, through the channel yeah. of political economy, the representation of workers and unions, will then affect their ability to command a higher wage issue. Higher wage. And I think some, there's some evidence for that in the superstar film. Right. Mm. are nonetheless still, you know, the Nordic case is certainly a mix of exporting and consumption, large public sectors and so on, um, but where the labour share is, is being held up. Uh, because, sorry, oh, it's not on. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, Derry has a question, and are there any other questions? Yes, if I... Uh, yeah. So, um... This is, again, I want to kind of rise above this and sort of look at the human condition and look at social media. Look at social media, the human condition. And when I go by train or when I walk in the streets, I see people looking at their mobile phones and I wonder how many hours in the day are they looking at their mobile phones and how many hours in the day are they doing banking or um, buying things on, from uh, Amazon or from uh, Netflix or from, goodness, and then you think, what did we used to do when I was young, back in the 1950s? Use, use a phone box. 50s. <laughs> <laughs> use a phone box, stand in a queue for a bank teller. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So things have changed, but we're doing a lot of do-it-yourself. And isn't a lot of the technological change moving in to do it yourself? Sure. In fact, we've become a do it yourself economy, surely. Sure. I mean, if people analyze the time they spend doing it yourself, shopping and goodness knows what else, then you then think, well, what, what would I do if I didn't have to do it yourself? Well, I, of course, I'd be very rich. I'd have a whole lot of yachts and I could have them all serviced. And so I, <laughs> I would no longer be doing it myself. I'd be rich. But the rest of us have to do it ourselves, really, right up to the top. Yes, WhatsApp. Government ministers spending so much time WhatsApping. <laughs> I mean, what about running a government? Yes. I mean, I'm not, talking, I'm not looking at local government ministers. I expect it happens everywhere and expect they talk to each other. The bankers certainly do. Yeah. I shall stop at that. Just a comment on do it yourself. Well, if you listen to the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, we're, we're, we've moved, we're not a do it yourself society anymore. We're, in his day, they, they used to you know, get food banks from their garden, but now, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so may, it depends what you mean by do it yourself, I guess. Well, some people love their allotments they grow their own vegetables. That's doing yourself. <laughs> 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 yeah, we have another question here. Yeah. Thanks very much for that presentation. Joe. Am I right in thinking when you showed the chart, different countries' um, labour share, that the that was the, just the, the UK was actually pretty flat or rising for the last few decades. Yeah, so yeah. since the late 90s it's been rising. It, it's the green, green yeah, one. Green one, yeah. yeah. Green one, is it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I thought what had happened to the Labour share in the UK was that it fell in the 1980s and the, yeah, the, the Thatcher that. years. And since then, as, you know, as your chart shows, as, uh, as yeah, risen. Exactly if it fell in the 1980s, uh, that was much more likely to be, to, uh, be due to government policy than to um, technology particularly the, the weakening of the unions, which I think Nick was, uh, was uh, just, just referring to. Um, so if it's not happening in the, 
in, in, in the UK very much. Well, why, why is that? And, and does it affect your, your, your argument? I mean, are, are you appealing to the wrong audience? Are you appealing to an audience where, where, where the underlying problem isn't, uh, isn't being exhibited? Am I? You, you mean I see because the UK doesn't have this doesn't have this problem. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess the the question is about because one of the problems in the UK economy has been a lack of investment in t technology. So I guess uh, maybe the reason we haven't seen a decline in the labour share is because <laughs> we we haven't we're not technologically advanced enough. Uh, so, so maybe, maybe, I mean, that's, that's not my argument, just to be clear, but that, that, <laughs> that could be an argument that people would, uh, that people would make about um, why you haven't seen the same trends. I mean, I think the fact that it's kind of rebounded a bit to be where it was pretty much in the, in the uh, 70s, or at least it depends what, what data you use. Um, you know, it, it's definitely an interesting puzzle, and I, you know, I, I don't really know. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be here if I knew the answer to it, probably. Um, but um, yeah, I, I guess um, to the extent that there has not been a significant decline in the labour share in the last twenty years in the UK, it would seem that there isn't an obvious reason to support UBI on those grounds in the UK. I agree with that, um, uh, but. There are plen plenty of other reasons to, <laughs> to debate whether it's a good idea or not. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it's pretty important to include mixed income, I, I think, in, in the labour share because yeah. that's influenced by tax, you know, particularly in, in small firms. If the, if, if the tax favours dividend interest, then uh, owners of small firms then mm. get all their income through dividend and not you, yeah, you pay themselves a tiny wage and, and, and so on. Couple of more questions, Richard. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if that last ten years or so was the other side of the productivity uh, slowdown in the UK. But um, uh, just on the question of uh, the, the sort of logic of the story. So, let's say that um, you are in a situation where technology is strengthening the power of employers compared to workers, and you do see a fall in the labour share for that reason. Um, there's then a question of you know, what's happening to that income, because uh, yeah. I was puzzled by the uh, gross disposable income, gross household disposable income thing. Because if the income isn't going to workers, it's going to firms. But then they, you know, they're not, are they retaining a lot of it, or is it going to? Do you see what I mean? Is it being distributed to the house, the richer households that invest and so on? Yeah. Uh, it's got to go somewhere. That's the kind of the uh, the, the puzzle in my mind. Um, yeah. And more generally, I think that. The whole question of how you look at technological change, um, you know, the channel could a, a, a way in which the benefits in terms of productivity from technological change get uh, diffused through the economy could be through lower prices for some things, and therefore the you know, higher real incomes for anyone, you know, for people buying consumer goods, say whatever. Um, so that you know, it, it it could be it could be shared with workers, uh, you know, being paid more. It could be um, uh, go into monopoly profits, or it could be distributed um, through lower prices. And I think we've probably seen a bit of all three. But mm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Was it was it was it a question? I mean, I, I agree. I agree. I agree with what you said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it I could be a like mixture of all just, three, yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Reflect on that, and yeah. maybe Nick would like to add anything to the point. Do you see any relevance? Uh, so, uh, Brian, no, sorry, so I let Brian ask his question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very quick one, just a general one. No, I, I need to give you the mic, sorry. Okay. So others can hear what you're asking. Yeah. Um, do, do you see any relevance in thinking in terms of whatever happens, you mustn't destroy aggregate consumer demand? Is there any problems with having that attitude? Well, it must be maintained, well, definitely, I think within the, if if we if we refocus on the UBI movement, I think it's an obvious tension within it because there's a whole part of UBI support which is the whole point is to reduce <laughs> consumption, reduce you know to to ease our way into a kind of um, environmentally friendly economy where people are, are not 
going out to, to earn as much as they possibly can all the time and that kind of thing. So, so I think um, I, I agree with the idea that, it, that it's an important thing to consider, but I would say probably that um, it's not easy to see how the UK, at least, can move beyond being a consumption, household consumption-based economy. I don't, I don't know what, what steps it could really take to, to completely shift focus of what, what drives uh, growth in, in, in the UK. So, so Nick, please feel free if you want to come in, just to come in. Um. Yeah, no, I think the, um, uh, I mean, look, you know, one of the reasons for yeah, looking at growth regimes was just, just to think about basic income in the context of what the main drivers of demand are. So there's definitely a, a, a view that looks at basic income through the perspective of the, uh, uh, the political economy of different countries, you know, how far the unions have a stake in the existing welfare state. Uh, you know, you might argue that a very liberal welfare state like the UK's has more of a place for something like a basic income because you have less vested interests in a more expansive welfare state of the kind you have in the Nordic countries. Uh, or, or, uh, and you might argue that the possibility of achieving something like a basic income in the, in the dual sy system countries like, like Germany, where you've got you know, very strong uh, social insurance for insiders in, in, in the manufacturing sectors, but weak in the out for the outsiders. Those outsiders don't have much power. The chances of achieving a, a universal basic income in those sectors is, is also weak. Uh, and to come to the point about uh, demand in the UK. So you might think a more liberal welfare state like the UK has a better chance then of sort of growing something like a, a Beveridgian style basic income as a flat rate benefit to people. Um, uh, and you might also argue that it can then play a role also in, in upholding consumption uh, and particularly ensuring that that consumption is, is better distributed than than is currently the case coming to your point about inequality is a problem is the problem here that the, there's inequality within the labor share um, and, uh, uh, and and you do see in the last 20 years of course also the growth of in work benefits the ta you know our social security system goes from simply paying pensioners and people uh, out of work to paying people in work to top up their wages and paying for the cost of raising children and that again might be argued to be uh, performing the function of maintaining household consumption, particularly in the lower in, in income groups. So that might be part of the, the sort of story uh, a, 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 as well. And I suppose just the final issue you raised about, is this the flip side of the productivity puzzle? Well, if you think that in insufficient demand has been what's you know, driven you know, the, the post-financial crisis productivity uh, slow down, whether that's through disincentivizing business investment or whatever the channel, then again you might argue that policies to maintain demand, if that's your rationale, might then have play a role in improving productivity. Yeah, I mean, you know, as Adam Smith famously said, the end of all production is consumption. I mean, you know, the economy is ultimately oriented towards uh, towards consumption, and even if we build cathedrals, you know, uh, you then measure that in terms of the utility consumption that people do or don't feel about the, the cathedral that's been built. But I mean, I want, in response to Graham, and one of my con worries, one of my questions really, in general, is whether the, in the UK, the increase in the retirement age has been part of the uh, effect on productivity. In other words, you know, people are staying in the office of the factory into their late 60s, um, but the output of that company um, isn't increasing. And to come back to Andrew's statement earlier, I mean, automation, uh, by definition, must be improving productivity. Um, the question then is how the benefit of that productivity is taken. Um, it can either be taken as greater output for the same labor, or it can be taken as lower labor for the same output. And I would agree with Andrew, but in, in that, the earlier period of the Industrial Revolution was clearly taken as the former. You know, we're taking increased output and standards of living against same labor. But we may, as you've been just saying, face a period where we take um, less labor for the same output. <laughs> Would you like to comment on it? Yeah. I don't. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. No, no. I was 
I'm not sure about that, whether the retirement age could have that large an effect on the productivity over no, such a long yeah. time. But um, I know a lot of my friends are hanging on in the back of this and all this is doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I wish they weren't doing before. <laughs> Which they weren't doing before. Well, they were doing before, but they've now <laughs> been replaced by 20 and 30 year olds who, who are now doing it, and they're just hanging they're around looking very like senior statesmen at Rolls Royce Aero <laughs> Engines in Filton. And I, 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 I promise you, they're not uh, producing a single extra aero engine. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're there just in case. Yeah. Sometimes we need the people there just in case as well. It would be interesting to run a regression to see where it has impacted and how. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you get more, more ideas from here. Any uh, other? Yeah? It's an, it's, an attempt to put, so it's an attempt to put social costs onto the product price. You know, so always in British social policy, uh, whether it's sick pay, whether it's um, retirement costs or whatever else, there's a push to pr push that out of the social budget and onto the product price. And... Uh, we have to question that, uh, that thesis, I think. We should accept the social cost and, and, and fund it by direct funding of government expenditure. Mm. Any other questions? Mm. Thank you very much. Saxon Brattel, I'm now an independent consultant, apparently. Um, I can't help looking at the Irish graph in front of me. <laughs> and uh, your reference to it as sort of magic numbers, <coughs> or maybe I put those words into my mind as you, as you said it. <clears throat> quite, quite clearly, they are numbers that have been collected yeah. by a national agency. Uh, and we actually know what that's all about, don't we? So it's probably useful to unpick some of that. It's something to do with the flow of foreign direct investment. Yeah. And I've written two things down here, which is offshoring and tax avoidance. Yeah. So it seems to me that's what we're looking at in this case. But is, is it not the case that underlying that amazing, or should I say, Amazoning uh, decline in the labour share in, in Ireland? Actually, what we're looking at is indeed the role of FDI in yes. facilitating embodied technological change. Uh, and embodied structures that utilise external uh, control to, to take forward. So it's a sort of a comment. It's a little, you know, no, no, it's of, I, I think it's a lot of unquestioned answers being given here. <laughs> I, th I think it's also, I mean, just like technology may be driving, you know, if we, if we think big picture here if, in terms of, you know, if technology is also weakening, if technology is the ultimate cause of weakening labour power, for example, it might also be the cause of <laughs> globalization in lots of ways is interacting with globalization and that facilitates things like foreign direct investment or tax evasion and all the rest of it uh, it also facilitates um, greater financialization of our economies and you know the complexity of um, <laughs> different ways that we can we can have uh, different financial instruments that you know are also gl globalized so the whole thing is is incredibly packaged together but for the purposes of trying to do an econometric study, you, you have sort of have to assume that these are distinct, dis <laughs> assume that they're distinct things. But obviously, I completely agree that these are all really in, in, interlinked. But then at that point, we just, you know, we only have to wave our hands in the air and say, well, technology is, is doing it. We have to try and explore the extent to which that's the case in the best way we can. And, and that's what we've, we've, we've tried to do in this, in this study. But of course, there are all sorts of... Um, ways in which um, these trends cannot be disentangled and, and yeah I mean you could say that that Irish decline is, is also technology in, 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 inadvertently but um, uh, also it's a, it's, it's a mix of lots of other trends as well. So. Yeah. 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 So there is so there is a truth behind the data yeah it's yeah. not just fabricated. It's not just fabricated. No. Any other questions? We still have 10 minutes to lunch. Oh, we can... yeah. <coughs> um, thank you very much for the questions. And I should have thanked you for the presentation, so I now do so. My question is about, this is, a, of course, a major, huge issue. It has been in applied economics for a long time, the labor share of GDP and why it changes and what do we understand by these changes. 
And what you're showing is this long-term trend, OECD trend. I mean, there are these differences. And clearly, the UK, the interesting thing is, why, why is the UK so different? And of course, the neoclassic economists would say, ah, the labor bar market has been freed up. But then you look at the United States yeah. and think, well, surely there's no more free market than in the United States. So I'm not now going to ask you, what is a free market in labor? <laughs> and how would you measure it? <laughs> measure the freedom of the labor market? Because you are talking about the labor market here, as defined by the OECD. Um. <laughs> well, the, the OECD d does have a, uh, a, a sort of regulation index for labour markets, so, yeah. you know, yeah. how, far they're, how far they're regulated. Yeah. 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 And, and, and you're right, we, we are at the kind of liberal market end, yeah. But it hasn't changed since no. the, the, the 80s in that sense. No, it, no, hasn't, it hasn't increased, we haven't become more liberalised than... than no. Then, so. no, but, so but things have easy. changed. We've become, you I haven't don't think become more liberalised, but we've become more um, um, self-employed haven't we? There's been an increase in self-employment. Huge increase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 14%. Um, and we've yeah. become more uh, divided. The labour market has become more mm. divided yeah. by deliberate economic policies and deliberate social policies, mm. which have divided it. And it's been divided also by immigration and emigration mm. and Brexit, mm. dare I say it. <laughs> I dare say it. I've said it. I've said the word. <laughs> And, that, and that's one thing, most of those things are not captured by the labour share because it's all happening within the labour share. Yeah. So, so, you know, the, I think the difference is, we, in this paper, you know, we look at the labour share, but I think there's as much to be discussed and, and picked apart about what's happening within, within the labour share between different groups. And clearly the, the big change has been inequality within the labour share yes. rather yes. than yes. the labour share itself. If we, we yes. want to think about the biggest shift mm. in the UK economy, although it has been relatively stable in the UK as well for a long time since the, since the 80s, but the big, huge shift in the 80s was inequality in, in income, yeah. so, yeah. And which has not been restored. I mean, it got worse. Hasn't, hasn't it got worse? Only wealth yeah. inequality rather than income I think inequality. In, income inequality has broadly been flat since the yes. early 90s, yes, yes. Uh, but although but the, the top 1% you see continuing to... Yes, increase, go, um, go and then, shooting and, off. And wealth yes. inequality is, yes. you know, yeah. jumps around there. Any other questions, comments? Let's see if people are hungry, waiting for lunch already. Now, I find personally it's really interesting the relationship you make to to green tr transition or the you know uh, transition to low low carbon economy or low greenhouse gas economy and the need to just consume less. And there's also the issue of um, just transition. The closing mines, um, moving to more modern technologies to produce energy. I think mm. it would be interesting to have a study and just see, you know, how this has changed things. You know, the current, you know, already that we have more wind turbines and the UK has moved to, you know, largely to wind energy and so on. Whether there's anything inside, you know, that we could start this at this tangling that. Any other comments, questions? Otherwise, we'll break for lunch. And the lunch is served downstairs, where you had your coffee. Okay. And we'll be back here at 2 o'clock. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you again.
waiting for our second one to be broken. Could you mute the, <laughs> the phone, please? Thank you. Good. Okay. W welcome back uh, to the afternoon session. Uh, we've got two papers in this session, as in, uh, as in the previous ones. Uh, David Fisherman is going to be first, and Graham Gudgeon second. Um, rather than I introduce them with the biography that you have anyway to read, I'm just asking each of them. I've already told David and Graham. Perhaps you would do the same. Uh, just to say what your interest was in the subject, how you got interested in it, if you see what I mean, how you, what motivated you, what engaged you, uh, and that can be your introduction to us. Okay. So um, we're in, uh, in David's paper, we're moving away from the empirical, which we looked mainly at this morning, uh, to, to think more about some of the concepts that we were talking about, particularly in the, the last uh, session of you know, what is meant by wealth in particular. Uh, and then Graham is going to return to the, the cost of living crisis and the role that Brexit may, may or may not have played. So, uh, David, over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Richard. And thank all of you for coming back to what was a very nice day. But we have to earn it. So, are you on? Should be on. It is now. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can break it again. <laughs> but um, primarily to want to thank Terry and Anella for the invitation. Um, I was very surprised to receive the invitation and I did come up with some pretenses for being invited. So these are my pretenses and we'll, we'll see if they are false or not. So I will welcome uh, your judgment and your contributions. So in relation to Richard's point, well, why am I interested in this? Well, I think I've been interested in wealth and value um, for many, many years. I, as a, an undergraduate in economics, I did try to unravel the world of value and economics and we can talk about that at greater length later on if there is interest but anyway I eschewed the academic life and went into the oil industry and I learnt a lot about the actually existing economy from oil and business. So starting with wealth, and I'm following in good footsteps. So we have Adam Smith um, and Marx. Normally people think, oh, Marx started with the commodity, but he didn't. He started with the wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of prevails is based on the commodities, but he's starting with wealth. So how do we define wealth? It's always good to start off with definition. And here we have empirical, practical definitions that are not controversial. We have the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report um, saying net worth or wealth is defined as value of financial assets plus real assets minus their debts. And then a recent paper 
by Alvaredo, Atkinson, Moretti. Actually, it was Tony Atkinson's last paper. This was um, posted in mid-December, and then on the 1st of January 2017 came news of his, his unfortunate uh, passing. So these are really equivalent definitions, and we have here the academic background, the practitioners studying wealth, but in the first case, this Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report, we have the focus on the high net worth individuals. So a lot of the focus on wealth comes from looking at wealth inequality. So Atkinson is, epitomizes this. But then we also have the chronicle of it for Credit Suisse and other financial institutions s do similar reports. Some of the real estate um, big organizations like Savills, they will do a, a global report on the value of property once a year. So there is this dual nature to the focus on wealth coming from inequality, but also focusing on the very rich. The lineage of, I think we have a problem. Okay. Of course, the modern study, empirical study of wealth, really comes back from the 60s, where Grayman Goldsmith in 62 published the first volume on cataloging and chronicling wealth in the United States. And then Jack Revelle in 1967 did the same for the UK. So really the empirical study and chronicling of wealth is fairly recent. Um, and as as we can see, there is this coinciding in the definition of wealth. But how does this relate to, to value? Well, the definition of wealth includes the word value, but this is the value of assets, a market price. So maybe just there is maybe some circularity here. Oh, the, uh, the amount of wealth is how much it's valued at. So really, are we defining anything here apart from just stacking up people's assets and taking away their debts? That may seem a trivial exercise. But let's look a bit at a bit more depth as to what goes into the breakdown of value. So this is from the Credit Suisse report looking at the evolution of wealth in the past uh, 20 years broken down between financial wealth and non-financial wealth or assets. So let's just, we can note that this is, the breakdown is more or less 50-50 between the financial and the non-financial. So the non-financial is really in land and buildings, which can be, we can see comes from the past, whereas the financial wealth is coming from the future. So equities and bonds. So these are wealth that we're bringing into the, the present from the future, expecting this wealth to materialize, whereas the non-financial wealth are what we call real assets. I don't like really this distinction between real and financial, but th this is the terminology. So this is coming from the past. 
So let's reflect a bit further onto this. And I'm using here the value terminology from capital, Marx's capital, to look at what I call the two triads of value and time. So we have value is labor time. So this we know we can look at embodied in commodities. And we can measure this, but in a very imprecise way. But this is, it's still the concept of value being the labor involved in the production of commodities. Exchange value is price, so this is the present. When we come to the point of exchange, then we know the price of things. And use value is what we purchase things for, for their use value. So we can look at this as being value from the past, exchange value the present, and use value the future. So let's go into this a bit further. There has been commentary that use value is being extinguished. That, oh, we're in an age of super, superfluity, and use value is no longer counting, and we're all um, with the excess of, of goods and commodities. Use, we don't need another generation of trainer or of iPhone or anything, and so use value is being extinguished. I don't think that's the case. But we have to also look at the whole panoply of value, meaning value, exchange value, and use value. And really, there's one type of commodity for which use value is critical, which is of that of capital. We don't consume capital in the normal way, but what is the use value of capital? Well, so how do we set the price for capital? We set the price by looking at the prospective yield. So bringing that expected yield to the future, we can come up with a net present value. Now, this is all basic finance 101 in business school, um, where this term fundamental value is brought out and then discarded so that the use, systematic use of fundamental value is not really pursued. But it's interesting to see that Marx in volume three completely anticipated this discounted cash flow net present value formulation of fundamental value, where he says capital here appears as a commodity. Its use value consists in producing profits. And that you don't look at the value of capital by the underlying value of, the, of what the components of capital, but you look at it in terms of how much surplus value, how much profit is going to be produced. So this sets the price for capital. The nice thing about the discounted cash flow NPV measure is that it is unequivocal. How do we measure profits for companies? Well, you can wade through the annual report and there is a, a line there for income, but there have been so much, so many transformations made to the cash flow uh, underlying that income that it is not a 
reliable and unequivocal measure. And this was indicated by the shareholder value school some decades ago, but really they took, they took it from the point of view of business and management and they were trying to extract more income from, for themselves. But it really does all come down to cash flow. And it's the only unequivocal measure we have. And if you were to ask the person on the Clapham Omnibus how you define income, they would say it's cash in hand. So when it comes to our personal incomes, we know very well that it's cash flow that matters. And so why should companies be any different? We can feasibly measure the cash flow that companies have on an annual basis. The statement that in annual reports that now include a cash flow from operations or get, go some way towards this. But really the measure of cash flow that I'm talking about is more like a, a free cash flow that some companies report. So With this perspective, where we can measure companies' incomes on a consistent basis, and we can project this forward into the future, and this is comprising the future component of wealth, which is about half of total wealth. And the other half of wealth comes from the past in land and buildings. So let me try and now relate this to basic income. I've really done some um, illustrative example. And I have to say I haven't, I didn't want to delve into the existing um, studies of UBI. I wanted to approach this uh, fresh. And so I came up with coming for an annual payment of £10,000 for adults, £5,000 for children and teens. And this would be an annual amount of £600 billion, But the net cost of this would be about half of this. If you net off the welfare and pension payments that would be foregone, you factor in extra income tax and then a bit extra for reducing the government bureaucracy, I think a, a figure of about half is about right for a net cost. We can... Con <laughs> now, this might seem odd to you, but I like to convert things to a capital value. So if we take an annual cash flow of 300 billion, we can convert this to a capital value of three trillion. And on a per capita basis, it's 44,000. So it is considerable amount, but total personal wealth in the UK is six, some 16 trillion. And so a UBI capital value of three billion is less than one fifth of this. So how do we think about bearing this cost? So if we want to focus on the wealth coming from the past, and I think that would be sensible, we don't want to burden future income with this. So we can look at the 8 trillion or so coming into with property and land. We could also look at the charity and not-for-profit sectors. Um, 
because these are more or less free of any fiscal burden. So the tax breaks and subsidies are both strong and long here. If we take this site here for downing, and I think I've got this right, that I looked up in the business rates register, and I think downing pays some 32,000 uh, annually in rates. And the, the commercial enterprises, of which Downing Conferences is one, and we're at one of their conferences, they pay no corporate tax, not because they're exempt, but because of offsets of the holding um, trust. So there is this sector of charity and not for profit that I think is fairly sizable, um, certainly in this country and other countries where charitable giving has been established and does get um, subsidies or tax breaks. So I think that there is scope for looking to these sectors to perhaps contribute because the, all the accumulated uh, wealth and assets have more, more or less been free of any contribution to the exchequer. There is also a big lack of information on this sector, so it's, it's not an easy one to, to go into. So, I want to sum up, and first of all, we have to, I have to agree with Terry that money is the most important fact in economics. Um, he often says this. I've only met him once, and he said it a couple times then, and then I saw him on a seminar a month or so ago on, um, on the Cambridge, what, what was that, the book that was recently published, and you said it again, Terry. So I'm, I have to agree with you. Money is the most important fact in economics, and this underpins my view of value and wealth. And you can't conceive of a cash flow surplus without conceiving of profit. And I think it's the, those are also goes the other way. You can't think of having a profit unless there is a cash flow surplus. So very simply, we project a cash flow surplus into the future and discount it and gives a net present value, a price of capital. So we can see wealth as being a function of future income and of past accumulation. Obviously, we have to know how we convert future income into a capital value for wealth at present. And we also have influences on land and property that are changing the valuation of this over time, representing the component of wealth from the past. But these are future studies to be done, and they're always things to be updated. But last of all, how do we see this for UBI? Well, we can see UBI is being feasible for the UK, and I think, why not go for a maximum UBI? 10,000 a year is, I think, probably about the right level that would ensure the effects that we're looking for. I had thought about making it equal to the um, tax-free band, which is, I think, 12,500, but I thought, no, let's give a bit of headroom so that people, in addition to their UBI, their first couple of thousand of earned of income will also be tax-free. So we can also target the wealth from the past for bearing the cost um, 
for UBI. And we can also look at the accumulate, that accumulated wealth in charity and trust to perhaps provide a bit of extra, extra help. So on that, I hope I've at least come up with some of the uh, fulfillment of my initial statement um, and look forward to questions and then later discussion. Thanks, David. So just questions of clarification at this point, if there are any, uh, if there are not, then Graham, over to you when your technology is arranged. And Graham, if you would just like, uh, David, just introduce yourself in terms of your interest in this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Graham Gudgeon. I'm a research associate, a retired economist basically, but research associate at the Centre for Business Research in the, in the business school just at the back here. And uh, also uh, I have the title, a bit non-operational these days, but of Chief Economic Advisor at Policy Exchange in London, which is one of the, one of the big think tanks. Richard asked me to say a bit about why, how I got into uh, doing this Brexit work. I mean, my, my background is social democratic. I was part of Wynne Godley's Cambridge Economic Policy Group, which was seen as left wing in its, in its day. And uh, I then spent a quarter of a century in Northern Ireland because the uh, uh, Wynne Godley's grants were cut off about five years into the Thatcherite period. But uh, that, that sort of research became um, pol politically unpopular. And um, so I worked very happily in Northern Ireland where I was running a research institute and then became special advisor to the First Minister. But I was partly happy there because Northern Ireland was a sort of Keynesian republic, I think, within the, within the UK, you know, floating on quite high public, public expenditure. Um, I got into Brexit. I, I, I voted for Brexit, uh, voted to leave, uh, not on any economic grounds. I didn't expect much change either way. Um, but I, I, I voted for it because I could see the EU slowly, fitfully turning itself into a United States of Europe. And I thought, yeah, you have to make a decision. You know, are you, would you prefer the UK to be a province of, you know, of, of this large multinational entity, or, or do you prefer it to be a sovereign state? My, my preference was the latter, um, so my preference was to to get out sooner rather than uh, sooner rather than later. Um, having made that decision, then as an economist, I decided to get interested in the various estimates that were put around for the economic impact of Brexit, um, particularly by the Treasury, but also uh, some academic groups and, and quite a lot of international organisations. And uh, w working with Ken Coates uh, in uh, my former colleague at Selwyn College, um, and also Neil Gibson in Northern Ireland. Ne Neil is now the, um, uh, he, he started off as my research assistant, but he's now the permanent secretary in finance in, in Northern Ireland. He took over Sue, Sue Gray's job, actually, so, but I hope he doesn't finish up like Sue Gray. But, uh, um, so he's, he's currently running a budget of 27 billion, I think, without, without any background in the, in the civil service. But it seems to be going all right. Um, but together with those two, we uh, were the only group, I think, which completely replicated the Treasury's uh, gravity model to estimate the impact of, uh, of Brexit, um, which the Treasury said if you don't get a deal would cost 7% of GDP eventually, and uh, the sort of deal we've got, they've, the conclusion is about 4% of, uh, of GDP. 
But we replicated that. It took us months. It was about a million pieces of trade data involved. It was a big, big job. And our conclusion out of that was that the Treasury had exaggerated the, the negative impact of Brexit by about 400%. Uh, we tried to talk to them about it. They absolutely refused to meet us. They refused to meet anybody else. And uh, had to be questions in Parliament before they'd even talk to a, uh, an MP about this. I, I thought it was a constitutional issue. And um, we, we did complain to the uh, then Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, and the Treasury Secretary, who was then one, Rishi Sunak. Um, we, 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 we tried, tried to get an investigation by the Treasury sub, Subcommittee, uh, sorry, the Treasury uh, Committee in Parliament on the Special uh, Select Committee uh, on this. We, we failed in that. Um, but. Um, um, both the Chancellor and, uh, uh, and Rishi Sunak promised that the Treasury would, would do no more uh, estimates of the impact of Brexit. And they've kept up to that right, right, until, uh, right until the present. So we, we, we did have some impact there. But once you get sucked into this, uh, you get sucked into a process where, where there are estimates of the impact of Brexit coming not so much from academia, but from think tanks and... Um, uh, uh, other bodies, and sometimes just by newspapers, media themselves, uh, almost every week. It just, just it, it's if you're sensitised to it, it's a sort of tsunami, uh, and it takes up a great deal of my time trying to respond to this and understand what what people have done and why they've reached their, their conclusions. Um, so that, that's how I got sucked into it, and uh, the, the, the results of being sucked in, you will yeah, you will hear now. So let's. Um, so I, I think I've messed up the technology already. Have I done that? Let's try and... No, there we are. I've, I've sorted my own problem out. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the latest of these estimates, I, I mean, the, in the last week or so, uh, Jonathan Haskell of the Monetary Committee, for, for instance, produced a an estimate that Brexit would cost every family in the UK £1,000, or, or, or would, would cost them uh, that. This was repeated very widely at BBC and uh, over the media without any questioning of, uh, of uh, what this was based on. Um, and then almost every week the, uh, the OBR is quoted as saying that Brexit will cost 4% of GDP. Uh, the, the OBR, by the way, doesn't do any calculations on Brexit. It, it merely quotes averages other, other studies, but uh, it's, it's universally quoted as, uh, as being the OBR's, uh, OBR's view. Um, now, I'd like to, just to, to link this to the theme of this conference, um, I take a, a, a macroeconomic measure of living standards, which is consumption per head, public and private, so private uh, household expenditure plus, pu plus public current uh, expenditure. And you can see the, see the trend there. That trend is, is a 2% trend. Okay, so we've been on that for pretty well the whole post-war period. There was a bit of a boom in the labour years, uh, but that ended in tears with the, uh, with, with, with the banking collapse. Um, partly due to labour um, spending but a great deal to do with uh, big increases in debt, in, in borrowing, and, and that's why it came to tears. And uh, so we get r right up until the end, and then suddenly we've got COVID. You can't see much effect, I think, of Brexit in you know, the referendum. Uh, and right at the end, we get hopelessly mixed up with COVID. By the way, the um, measurement of GDP uh, in the COVID years is exaggerated. Uh, in the, in the, the ONS does a rather good thing. It, try, it tries to measure real output in the public sector properly. Uh, for instance, in health, number of operations done of different sorts, in schools, how many pupils are taught, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I hadn't realized that most other major countries don't do that. They just take the expenditure and deflate it. Um, so um, what happened in COVID uh, was because the NHS stopped doing its standard operations which were being, which were being measured uh, and had to do a lot of other things on COVID. 
um, the ONS reported a huge decrease in activity. Um, so I think my, my daughter who works at Adenbrooks was a bit, bit surprised to know that her output had decreased by 20% during the COVID years when they were all uh, fantastically overworked. Uh, so th there's a mismanage, mis mismeasurement there. So um, living standards haven't fallen as much as that graph. Showed. I, I just reported the ONS numbers here. But, um, uh, and, and have perhaps picked up rather more. So I just mentioned that mismeasurement point. And here is um, this consumption, again, public, public and private as a percentage of GDP. And the only point I want to note here is that in the last quarter of a century or so, it's been fairly, fairly flat, so that the ratio of, uh, of consumption to GDP is whatever, whatever it is there. What's that, about uh, 80, 83%. And I only put that up so that I can now move on to talking about the impact of Brexit in, in the way that critics talk about it, uh, which is in terms of GDP, um, trade and, uh, and inflation, rather than living standards. But you can translate anything I say about GDP, you can translate into li living standards directly. So what impact has Brexit had? There's uh, real GDP, that's just a, a volume uh, index. And um, I've compared it with the G7, uh, and you can see right at the end, re really nothing much happening until the COVID pandemic. Uh, and then the UK recovers from the COVID pandemic a bit more slowly than, uh, than the G7. And there's a degree of mismeasurement in there as well, so it's hard, hard to know exactly what that, uh, what that means. But if we, if we look at that... Um, later period, here's the period since 2015. Uh, the red pecked line is the G7 again. But if I take the US out of the G7 and have a G6, then the UK has actually done better. So the, uh, our GDP growth looks as if it's a bit worse than the G7, but that's only because of the, uh, of the US. So why is the US doing better? Why does that make such a difference? Um, and the reason seems to be the big fiscal expansion, both under Trump and Biden. Uh, so that the right-hand half of that chart is post-2016. Um, and and that, that's the primary, uh, primary budget deficits difference between the US and the UK. And uh, so if it's negative, that's a, that's a, a bigger US fiscal expansion than the UK. See, for m most years... Uh, a big difference in fiscal expansion. So the, the US has been expanding, big Keynesian push in, 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 the, in the US under, under both these big, well, mostly under the Republicans. And, uh, but um, as we know from the Reagan years, that uh, Republicans often turn out to be quite Keynesian. Um, if we compare the UK's GDP growth more generally, uh, it's the, the solid red line, oh, no, sorry, it comes out orange on that screen. Um, uh, UK is a solid uh, orange line um, and we can see the UK doing better than most G7 countries except the US and, and Canada uh, again. So nothing much to write home there uh, about hard to pick out any effect of Brexit uh, out of that but nevertheless people do it. If you're very sharp eyed if you compare the end of the chart which is 2022 quarter three with 2019 quarter four, which has got a, a pecked vertical line. You can see the, the UK is just slightly below that. And, uh, and if you look at the other countries, they're, they're mostly just slightly above it. So there were a lot of forecast, a, a lot of um, stories in the press about the UK being the slowest growing UK uh, G7 country since since the end of, of 2019. But you, you're picking your dates there. I mean, my, 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 my general point is the UK seems to have done okay and uh, hard to see any effect of Brexit. Here's manufacturing output, which isn't affected by mismeasurement. And uh, you can see there, uh, for some reasons which I don't fully understand, the UK seems to have done much better than most of the um, uh, EU countries. 
Right, I now want to come on to uh, what are called doppelgangers. This is, um, sorry, there we are. Uh, this is a synthetic control um, uh, method. And um, this has been championed by the, the Centre for Economic uh, European Reform, which is a, a pro-European pro think tank. And, uh, but very much taken up by, by the media, the BBC, Financial Times, Economist, uh, all do this, to show that uh, if you have a counterfactual uh, in the way that it's done here, then the UK has underperformed that counterfactual um, by about five, five and a half percent so far. So we get lots of headlines saying that already the UK is five and a half percent behind. Now it's a bit strange given that we're looking at, you know, we've been looking at GDP and we didn't see much in, the, in those comparisons. So what's happening here? So this doppelganger, uh, sorry, that, that's the nickname it gets, this, this counterfactual, is, is an index. Sorry, where have we gone? Uh, it's an index built of a weighted average of 22 other um, largely rich OECD uh, countries. And I put the weights there. The biggest weight is the United States, which has a weight of 0.3, 30% weight. Then you've got Germany, New Zealand, Norway, Australia, Iceland, all, all having weights of more than 5%. Uh, but pretty well every country gets a weight. There are just three at the bottom, Austria, Belgium and Japan, which have a, a zero weight. So you weight all those countries together, uh, weight the index, and you, 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 you get the index that I showed in the previous chart, which was the, the pect line there. Now the first thing to say about this, and what's never said in the press, is that these 22 countries forming this index are often not at all correlated with the UK, but you're somehow putting, putting together 20, 22 series of growth in GDP uh, to, to, to get an index. And I think you can always do that. If you have enough data, you, could, you, you can always weight it in a, in a fashion to get uh, something which will match the UK. I haven't done it yet, but I, I, I quite like to put the number of stalks in Middle Europe, you know, and, uh, in, in there as a variable and see if it picks that up as well. But let, let, let me just show you what I mean here. So Australia and New Zealand are, receive quite high weights in this index. Um, and the, 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 they are the pec, uh, two pec lines there. And you can see Australia and New Zealand both grow faster than the UK. Um, they did before 2016 and they've continued to, to, to do so. So why, why, why they're in there as major components of a comparator index, I don't really know. Uh, even worse, Greece is in there. It only gets a low weighting of about 2%, but it's in the index. Um, and you can see as, uh, as the UK continued to grow before 2016, uh, Greece was a collapsing economy. Uh, after the banking collapse, but it's in there as part of the part of the index. I mean, this this makes no sense to me at all. Um, but the Financial Times and the Economist uh, and so on uh, are quite happy to quote the results of this without without any criticism of it at all. Um, here I've showed, for instance, Germany compared to this UK index. Um, you can see before 2016, that's before the vertical line, uh, Germany uh, over the whole period since, what's that, 2009, uh, had grown at exactly the same rate as the, the UK, um, continued to, uh, to do so for, uh, continued to grow as fast as this doppelganger index for a few years, but has then fallen away. I don't think anybody, anybody thinks that Brexit has had a... Uh, I think that's about a 7% uh, negative impact on Germany. Sorry, somebody said they, they do. Terry, Terry, I think, might do. He'll tell us later. Tell us later. Um, here's Japan as well. Tended to grow at something like the UK rate right before 2016. Uh, uh, and uh, similar to this doppelganger index. But again, has fallen away badly since 2016. So 
Sorry, do, do, uh, anybody need any clarification? Yeah, okay. So, sorry, I, I just wonder if they needed clarification on what this doppelganger was. Um, so Japan falls away as well. But nobody, I think, that thinks that Japan has had a huge negative impact from Brexit. Um, and the doppelganger index is much the same as the, the US. I've put the US there and the doppelganger index, and you can't, really can't see any difference between them. So if we're comparing with this index, we're really comparing with the US. And as I've already said, uh, the US had such a big fiscal expansion compared to the UK after 2016 that we expect it to grow slower. It may have to pay for that expansion later on with slower growth, but so far it's been growing faster. The next thing that the, the media rather loves um, is to say that the big thing that's been affected by Brexit has been business investment. And then some people like Jonathan Haskell of the Bank of England then convert that into a GDP loss. If you have less, in, less investment, less capital stock, um, lower, lower GDP. And here's what they generally do. This chart was in the Financial Times a week ago, and then it was shown twice on Newsnight, BBC Newsnight last week, just in case you didn't get the point first time, they showed it, a, showed it again a uh, second time. So the, uh, the, the main blue line here is uh, business investment in millions of pounds, constant prices. And what happens is that um, people, including the Financial Times, put a trend line through the upturn in investment from after the banking collapse from 2009 up to 2016 uh, and then continue that trend on so you assume that a, a cyclical upturn lasts forever uh, and then take the difference between that and what actually happened and say well that's that's an impact of brexit because it started in in, in 2016. Uh, I mean, I think I, if I'd have got that as an undergraduate essay when I was teaching at Cambridge, I think I would have sent it straight back, but uh, okay. told them to start again. But anyway, Financial Times and BBC is happy with that. Um, if you fit a trend to the uh, data up to 2016 and ex extend it on, uh, just a regression trend, that's what you get. So it's a much less steep uh, trend. Uh, I'll come back to Germany. So here's what Jonathan Haskell did. So he took a, uh, a trend between two points, and those two points were 1997 quarter three and, and 2016 quarter two. The, that was the quarter in which the, the referendum happened. And, and that's the, the red dotted line. Uh, so there's a trend. He continued that on. He said uh, um, business investment would have carried on on that trend. And then he accepted that business investment was rather hit by, uh, by Brexit. Um, but he, he, he thinks business investment would have grown at 2% per annum faster than it actually did through the COVID years. Um, so his, his dotted red line is, uh, has a much faster recovery. First thing to say about this is he was using out-of-date data. You can see just on the right-hand side, you can see a, a solid red line. That's the revised ONS data. So you see the, the U, UK was actually doing much better at the end than uh, Haskell assumed. And this is the analysis that, that led him to, to, uh, to the conclusion that Brexit cost us all, a, uh, each family, a thousand pounds each. Um, if you fit the regression trend instead of his two point trend, you, 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 you get the lower trend line. And the importance of this is that 2016 then becomes uh, a point well, well above the trend. So it was a peak of a, a cycle, in a, in a sense. The way Haskell did it, fitting between two points, 2016 quarter two has to be on his trend because he was only fitting his trend between two points. Uh, and therefore, 2016 can't be uh, above or below trend. So he's, 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 he's actually building that into his analysis. Uh, and therefore, he can't argue that um, because business investment was above trend, um, then it, it m the cycle might well have turned and gone down. If I run an equation with my model, we also get a, uh, a downturn. But um, 
uh, business investment is notoriously difficult to, uh, to um, uh, forecast, perhaps the most difficult part of the economy. Um, so I think Hask Haskell's analysis there was you know, absolutely flawed. Uh, but that didn't stop the BBC or the Financial Times or the Economist recording that as, uh, as almost factual. Last point on investment. Here's Greenfield Foreign Direct Investments. This is foreign direct investment into the UK where it's, it's actually a new activity. It's a new factory. It's a new uh, office activity. Um, and that's the value in millions of dollars each year. And um, the US is higher, but you can see the U UK is higher than all these major European economies and has continued to be so uh, after Brexit. Uh, some critics of this work say, oh yes, but the, you know, the gap between the UK and Spain and, the, and Germany has narrowed uh, since Brexit. Um, but the, the gap between the UK and France hasn't, or, you know, or, or between the UK and Italy. Um, so again, I don't think there's any particular evidence there to show that, um, uh, that investment has been doing worse in the UK or that foreigners, foreign investors, uh, have been uh, viewed the UK as, uh, as a poor bet. Um, sorry, how am I doing for time? I, I, I didn't notice when I started. Okay, for a few minutes. Thanks. Right, quick, quickly on to trade. If Brexit's <coughs> having an effect, we'd expect it to have its biggest effect through trade after so after all this this is a trade change we've left the single market we're now facing uh, customs checks and higher non-tariff barriers there are administrative costs now of getting into the uh, EU single market um, there aren't any tariffs so it's, it's only non-tariff barriers but uh, nevertheless they're, they're, they're real real extra costs um, so the solid blue line is uh, UK exports to the EU uh, and we can see there that uh, they've recovered their um, pre-COVID pre -COVID levels. Interestingly, uh, UK exports to countries outside the EU haven't recovered. So actually our exports to the EU have done better than our exports to the rest of the world. Uh, now, th these are exports excluding oil, so we, we have a declining exports of oil for, uh, for geological rather than economic reasons. Uh, and it also excludes erratics, but it doesn't include cars, for instance, where, the, where there's been quite a big problem in, in just getting components from the Far East, and that's hit uh, exports both to the EU and, and to the, uh, the rest of the world. The reason why... Uh, uh, <coughs> What way um, non -EU, uk exports to non eu destinations have, uh, have, uh, have done so poorly i think isn 't terribly well understood and, and there may be people here who 've looked at this more than more than I have. What has come down is not exports so much but imports from the eu are about twenty percent lower than they uh, they were before. One of the consequences of that is that uh, our balance of trade with the EU has actually improved because exports have done better than, uh, than imports. Um, but imports are quite tricky. The, 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 there was, for instance, in clothing, a lot of clothing tended to come into the UK from Bangladesh uh, and then be re-exported out to the EU. Uh, and I think because of the trade changes, some of that is now going directly into the EU. So the, 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 there have been changes in the direction of trade but not in a way that affects the UK economy very much. Um, just very quickly, uh, just focusing there on the, uh, the period just before and after uh, the, the new trade arrangements came into effect, the end of January 1921, uh, what we can see there was there was a, an increase in exports to the EU just before that, uh, and that was probably a, a stock building. So. Uh, companies got their exports in on, onto the continent before the new arrangements came in. And then there was quite a big fall in, in exports immediately afterwards, January and February 2021. Um, and and af after that, there's been a, a slow recovery. 
and UK, uh, I think this is goods exports, not quite, um, tend to be uh, highly correlated over time with uh, manufacturing output in the, in the Eurozone. And you can see in the period 2020-21 that there's, there's quite a lot of volatility. Um, but by the end, we pretty well got back to where you might expect our, uh, our goods exports to be. And on services exports, the, the lower line is services exports to the EU, and that seems to have re recovered um, back to its previous trend. Our much bigger service exports are to non-EU countries, and uh, they, they, they fell a bit and then recovered, but they've done much the same as, uh, as service exports from the US uh, to, to the rest of the world. So again, on service exports, Nothing much to report, I think. And then I'll finish on inflation. Uh, some people have tried to try to suggest that the recent inflation has got something to do with Brexit. But that's really a rather hard one to uh, uh, to pursue, I think. So you can see there. Here's headline CPI inflation. That's the UK, the Euro area, and the US. Uh, and you can see they, they they all go up pretty well together, and very much for the same. Uh, reasons of uh, uh, much higher energy costs and other raw material costs. And um, if we take f uh, food and energy out of it, then the UK is intermediate between the US and the, uh, and the EU. But um, nothing there, I, th I think, to suggest that the UK has performed very differently from anywhere else, uh, and therefore that Brexit's had, had much effect. So, I conclude on this. My conclusion is that, that the UK has neither gained nor lost anything much economically from, from Brexit, uh, much as I expected uh, before the referendum. The main impact on trade is in extra non-tariff barriers into the EU. Um, they're, they're, they're real, but not huge. And, and, and that's about it. It doesn't seem to have had a, a very big impact on trade probably has had a, a real impact, negative impact on exports from small companies into the EU. Uh, I think where the extra paperwork and so on has made it um, non-viable. But that doesn't seem to show up in the aggregate figures, so it looks like the, the bigger companies are, 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 have just rid ridden this pretty well. Smaller, some smaller companies are, are affected. Uh, other factors like migration, um, seem to be mainly a matter of um, uh, changing origins and, and destinations. So fewer people are coming from the EU than came before, but more from non-EU uh, destinations. And as we know, the figure for last year was, was half a million, I think the biggest, biggest ever net, uh, net immigration. So my final conclusion is that look, slow growth in living standards and in productivity is a really big issue. Uh, and I mean, I, uh, I, I, I can congratulate you on running a conference on this. And, you know, and we ought to keep doing that. This is really the big issue facing the UK and many other uh, Western economies. That essentially living standards have stopped rising now, having risen for nearly all my lifetime. And you can see by looking at me, my lifetime is quite long. And uh, it's, yeah. living, rising living standards is something we took for granted, and it's no longer there. And I think the repercussions of this, are, you know, we still haven't faced them all, both social and, uh, 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 and economic. But in, in that slow growth in living standards, as far as I can see, Brexit doesn't play any real role. So I think we should put that aside and, and focus on the, on the real issues, which are complex enough. Uh, with, without bothering about Brexit. So with, with that, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Graham, thanks very much. Um, we'll have questions now for David uh, and Graham. Uh, Terry, yeah. Um, my, my question's for David. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, the measurement of wealth. Um, of course, that is key to understanding where we are and how we've changed, we being the country or the world, in terms of wealth. Uh, but you aggregated, uh, one of the charts showed separately financial and real wealth. 
and you commented on that. And indeed, this is a major issue, isn't it, as to how we measure real wealth, because I don't think financial wealth is real wealth. I don't think finance, I don't think money is real at all. I think it's an idea. And, but I do think this, these buildings and we as people and these things in front of us, I think they're real. But I don't see any money here. I just see people and things which are useful. That is, to me, real. And money is just an idea. That's, so I would... <laughs> I don't think that money, wealth, has any meaning whatsoever. I think it's a null, void concept, M money wealth. I think real wealth, yes, I think I, this is real wealth. Ideas are real wealth. Um, now, if you brought in a whole lot of gold coins, I would say that looks like real wealth. They're real, those coins, but you haven't. There aren't any gold coins that I can see. So. Um, so that's a sort of rather basic point about adding <laughs> real and financial wealth together because to me, if you do that, it's a, you've got a completely misleading and wrong and misguided total, even if you net off the debts, whatever they are. Are they real debts or financial debts or what how, debts are they? How do you value companies and how do companies you value engage com in investment? You value companies by the real articles and services they produce. Yes, and they are going to produce that into yeah, but, the but money hasn't come into this. I haven't mentioned anything about money. Well, yeah, money is... How, how, how would I value this college? I wouldn't put it in money terms because it, that would be meaningless. How, how would you value Downing College in money terms? It's a nonsense. It doesn't, doesn't work. How would you value a view of the moon? last night. Hmm? I'll leave you with that question. Uh, do you want to try and respond to that or let it hang? <laughs> getting a bit philosophical. I, there, I think there is a, there is a question about yeah, the meaning of, of financial wealth. Uh, because as we know, it, it's you know, fluctuated enormously and it depends very much on expectations of the future and so on. And, exactly. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to order it. At least we can s consider it in, a, in an ordered framework. And so I'm differentiating between the wealth we're accumulating from the past and then the wealth that we're anticipating coming from the future. That's not real. Oh. Okay. Well, <laughs> if you net off financial liabilities, it solves Terry's problems, I think. If you net off financial liabilities of the, well, of the financial wealth, well, it solves your problem because it comes to because the financial bit comes to zero. Okay, let's let's leave that. I'm not sure we're getting anywhere further with that. <laughs> um, I've got a question, Graham. Um, I mean, I, I'm interested in, in what you say, and I think that uh, obviously. Uh, the sides that people take over Brexit has influenced the way that, you know, what they choose to, to find in the data. Um, I just wanted to ask you whether you'd looked at, when you looked at the recovery of export, because I, I would expect to see it in trade, first of all, and, and, the, and these stories about small firms, I mean, they're only anecdotes, but you could imagine that they're borne out, but as you say, trade's dominated by uh, the trade by large companies who presumably can manage, even if there are higher costs, they'll manage. You know. um, but I wondered whether... Um, you had looked at the uh, recovery of trade within the eurozone. Uh, if you, should, you know, the, the kind of exports within the eurozone, and compared that to our exports, just to see whether there's any difference there, or whether you could. Uh, so, do, do, do you mean the, the exports of eurozone countries? Yes, to, to each other. Yeah, to, and compare to, to with each us. Other. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a research group in Dublin that ESRI have look, looked at that, I think, uh, and, and they suggest that the UK has done worse. That, that, that trade has picked up. It's picked up by more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One of the problems is though, that the, the measurement of exports has changed since, since we left the EU. Uh, before, when we were in the EU, we, we, we had to value our, or, or we, we, we used, I think, VAT returns to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to measure exports. 
Um, and now we're a third country in the EU, so they, they no longer... We don't have that. They, they, right. they, well, they, they apply a different measure to, right. to third countries. So that's a, that's a difficulty in making that, okay. uh, in, okay. in that comparison. But people have done it tend to suggest that the intra, EU intra-trade has... It's picked has up by more than faster. our... Yeah, yeah, OK. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, just a clarification point, I guess, that someone else also might know, but I was just wondering why, I was just wondering how many of the trade deals that we had as part of the EU have been, are all of them rolled over in, into the UK? So do we, I was thinking of ex explanations for why non-EU trade might have, have gone down. Was, is there anything to do with the trade deals that we might not have access to? Or that's, that, it's just a simple. Uh, yeah, my, my understanding is we've rolled them all over. And we've improved some, so that the Japanese one is a bit more than it was the, the, than the, the one they had with the EU. Um, and, and, and then we've, we've got a few new ones as well, Australia and New Zealand, which are partly kicking in. And I'm told that the big one, the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership one, should be announced. I was told it would be announced in March, so it, it sh should, should be announced quite, yeah. quite soon, I think. Trans-Pacific Partnership is a bit of a misnomer. It, it actually includes a lot of the white, com the old Commonwealth, as well as Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, are all in there. But it does include a, you know, quite a number of fast-growing fast countries. Um, so what, one of the things I, I mean, I didn't argue, didn't argue it in this talk because I wasn't talking about projections and, and the future very much. Um, but I would argue that we're undergoing a slow change in the direction of our trade. In the, in the direction of the Pacific countries and away from the EU, and the EU is a very slow-growing part of the of the world. It's it's not a bad tactic to do if you can if you can pull it off. I think to you know, withdraw yourself from the slow-growing markets and try and get into the, the fast. Maybe slow-growing, but a lot nearer, yeah. of course. And in, <laughs> and in the long run, India might be the big prize. India is mm. a very highly protected market, mm. like 350 percent tariffs on Scotch whisky, for instance. Uh, uh, you know, so if we can get into that market more, but that that is currently, I, I think, um, bogged down in a lot of political difficulties, particularly that BBC program on Modi, which the Indian government has, has greatly objected to. Didn't like, yeah, okay, uh, yeah. So, uh, Anne. Thank you. Um, on the question of uh, whether EU exports holding up uh, really has um, an important social meaning. Um, I, I just wonder about the sector distribution of this regrowth of exports since the pandemic. Um, I mean, anecdotally from the press, you, see a you hear horrible stories about people trying to export fresh food, particularly where bureaucracy for small firms is um, involved. But you also hear about a number of companies moving their head office into continental Europe which probably leads to a lot of extra within company transfers of goods and money that didn't occur before. Um, so I'm wondering if, if those um, sort of overriding factors, which maybe conceal some of the social realities about the um, dynamic future of jobs, should concern us. Thank you. Yeah, uh, th thanks. Yes, good, uh, good points. Um, I think the first point comes back to the small, small firms issue. Uh, I was talking about, uh, if the BBC or the press want, want to find somebody affected by Brexit, they, they almost always go to a small company. You, you know, you go to some mm. small cheesemaker in Somerset or, or, or something, and they say, oh, paperwork's really getting me down, uh, and, and, and such. So those are real effects, but, but, but the, 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 they don't look as if they're of macroeconomic uh, Im importance. Um, I mean, it may be a bad thing that, that, that quite a few of our small exporters are, are no longer doing it because perhaps we'd have hoped that some of those would have grown into uh, mm. bigger exports mm. over time. Uh, but it doesn't seem to have affected our export total very much. Um, and your second point, uh, I, I mean the headquarters and the moving was mainly out of the City of London and um, Ernst and Young do surveys on this. They, they think about 7,000 jobs were relocated to f mainly Frankfurt and, and Paris. But quite a few coming the other way as well which isn't, isn't reported. Uh, and if we, look, we, if we look at the employment totals in the city, I mean, it's, it's risen quite a bit. There doesn't seem to be a big, uh, a, a big impact in, in, the, in the city. And that's one of the forecasts, I think, that was re really badly wrong. 
uh, finance didn't get much advantage uh, out of the TCA trade agreement we had, but they've carried on, they find ways of, of mm. doing it. Just as Cambridge Econometrics has, I think, they've um, mani managed Brexit quite well. <laughs> it spurred us to change, anyway. Yeah. I think, thanks for that. Um, you use GDP a lot, and I, obviously we're talking about the impact of uh, cost of living. To what extent do you think GDP is representative of how well we're doing in, in some generic sense, if you like? Yeah, I, I, I'm still happy with it uh, as a measure. I mean, you know, lots of people do criticise it, you know, sometimes on environmental reasons or, or the fact that, you know, some things like housework and homework and so on aren't, uh, aren't included. But I always take it, it's, it, it's just the aggregate of the incomes which, which are earned by market activities. And I, 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 I think it's fair enough. I tried to show at the beginning that the ratio of my measure of living standards to GDP was fairly stable. So anything you can say about GDP also applied to... It's a, your to, consumption to, measure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 I think it, ten, it tends to be... Because things, the things that are wrong with it <laughs> don't change very much in the short term. It's not bad for short term changes. But uh, uh, yeah, was there another... Question, yeah, Terry. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank both of the speakers for a very provocative and interesting and well-researched uh, talks. Um, I have one more comment to, for, for David, and that is I agree entirely with your NPV as a value of projects or companies. I mean. I mean, of course, you've got to know what rate of interest and whether it's an internal one or what. But, I mean, subject to that, I mean, that is, that is how to value uh, companies in terms of what they might produce. And, uh, in fact, that's what a bank would ask if it was giving a loan to a company. Or that's what a government would ask. Or if it was, for example, the, the battery plant up in the northeast if you're going to save that, you'd want to know what the NPV was of the batteries it was going to produce, i.e. a stream of real things, batteries, uh, and you turn that into a money value, present money value. So, now, and to Graham, I've got two, two lots of questions, um, both one relating to the economics and the other to um, the social and political effects of Brexit. Um, on the economics, um, I, I find it difficult to accept what you've done, but I haven't done the work. I've basically moved on in terms of mm. the analysis of Brexit. I've just seen it as an unmitigated disaster. Um, my question on the, the other aspect is, do you consider Brexit to be a political success? Um, for I mean, whom, I suppose, for whom, yeah. On your first question, Terry, uh, uh, I mean, I think on, you know, on the data presented, uh, I mean, it's absolutely clear it, it hasn't been an unmitigated economic disaster uh, at all. And there were plenty of people like you who thought it might be, uh, and it hasn't been. So, you know, I, I hope we could, we could all accept that. You, you could say perhaps on balance it's been a bit negative or... or well, not many people who say it's a bit positive, but um, but unmitigated disaster, you know, come on. Um, on your second point about politics, uh, I mean, the big thing to say is just how divisive it's been, I mean, mm. socially and mm. uh, and politically. And that was quite a surprise to me. I, I mean, I, I thought one of the things I, I sometimes reflect on is that right up until the results on whatever it was, 23rd of June, 2060, I don't remember anybody on either side saying anything very good about the EU. I mean, those, those who favoured remaining tended to say, well, OK, the EU is a bit of an irritating organisation, but on balance we should stay, and it's too difficult to get out of. Um, and that, that seemed to be the balance of opinion right up until that point. And then the next morning after the result came in, suddenly half the country was in tears, and, and it really mattered to them, and, and this was a terrible thing to happen. And I still don't really understand it. But, but you have to accept that it is, it, it is the case. The country's been badly divided, uh, and I think that's the reality of, of, of the politics of this. 
and quite large parts of the country and by and large the more influential what some people call the Brahmin classes have tried quite hard to undermine it. I mean rhetorically by for instance referring to a hard Brexit when I think we voted for Brexit you know so you, you call what, what, what we've got a hard Brexit make it pejorative um, and in Parliament trying to overturn it or well, I don't know if there are any Liberal Democrat voters here but I've, I find that the, the, the Democrat part of that that title I find hilarious in a party that wanted to overturn the, the results of a, uh, of a legal and democratic and, and properly conducted referendum, but, but, uh, but there we are. So, no, it, it's been politically very difficult, but it's the Remainers who made it do it. I mean, a lot of people just haven't accepted the result, and I think showed themselves as really not accepting mass democracy in, 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 in that sense. Um, I mean, living in Cambridge, I have, have to accept that I'm in a, I'm in a small minority but, uh, but I always console myself by saying that uh, nationally I'm in a, in a majority. And that majority consists very largely of working class people. Uh, and I think Brexit does matter to them. It's the, it's the basis of, uh, uh, for a lot of people, uh, the sovereign democratic state like the UK is the basis of their security, prosperity and identity. And that matters a lot more to working class people than it does to very cosmopolitan middle class people that are in touch with people all around the world, speak languages, you know, shooting off to conferences uh, all, all, all the time. So we've got different parts of the population. But I come from a working class background, and so I'm on that side. OK, all right. And well, thanks rest. very much. Uh, oh, go on, just one more from you, Jeff, then. Well, I, mean, you know, I, also come, uh, I also come from a very working class background. I've known poverty and prosperity in my life. Um, but you are fairly pejorative with respect about the views of those of us who want to remain in the European Union. And uh, I, I accept the outcome of the vote, I regret the outcome of the vote, and personally, you see, I feel that I've lost a lot in my life that I valued. And I valued the fact of being European, European culture, the Renaissance, you know, we, the Enlightenment, we all share those European roots. Now, you may argue that we still maintain them, and in some ways we do, but they have been made more difficult. The membership of the Horizon program and our science and research, um, the simple fact of traveling around, you know, again, you were fairly pejorative of those of us who travel. I travel quite a lot because my profession has required me to do so. I mean, it's now much more difficult. I, I nearly missed a connection in Amsterdam the other day because of the passport check. So, I mean, there are some simple things like that. But the main one for me, actually, is not economic, but it's identity. Um, and geopolitically, um, if the world is now uh, divided into the American-China nexus and Europe nexus, I don't think there's a, part, there's a role for a third independent nation in that. So I think we, we have lost um, an area of influence where we brought, and the European Union feels this, you know, we brought a, 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 a contribution they valued. Um, it seems to me that's much less valid now we're independent. But well, So whilst I respect your view, I think I'd probably ask you to respect ours too. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly do. Sorry, if I sounded pejorative, I, I, I didn't mean to be. I was, I was just trying to be descriptive. You, you know, that you, you are the sort of people who who voted to remain for perfectly good reasons. I mean, for your, you, you know, for your own personal self-interest. And I accept you've, you know, you, you've lost something out of it in the 90 days, perhaps you'd have preferred longer, longer spells in the sun than 90 days at a time. Um, so no, no I, 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 I accept all that and I don't, don't mean to be uh, uh, pejorative at all. But there are, the, the, there are different interest groups in the, in, in the country and I, and I think that the basically working class group uh, you, you know, had, the, had the majority here um, and it was a zero sum game and um, you know, that, that's the way it goes. And I don't think you've lost a great deal. I mean, you've still got your house in France and you still go back and forth. This is a debate <laughs> that will <laughs> go on. Can I just reply very, very... All right, go on, go on, Graham. Reply very quickly to uh, Geoffrey's geopolitical point, which I think is a much more important one. Um, uh, and several of my Remain voting friends vote, voted Remain very much on that reason. You know, they thought being part of the EU was... a you know, made us geopolitically stronger. Um, I'm just not sure that, that, that that's true. I mean, it's a fair argument, and I think it's something we can debate on, on both sides. But the, the, the big geopolitical body, the one that really matters in the world, I've always thought, is NATO uh, and, and the American alliance. I mean, we, 
we may get exasperated with the Americans, but crikey, they're, 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 they're the source of, source of our security uh, in the world. And the EU doesn't come anywhere near this. And I'd have thought the Ukraine war uh, I mean, has exactly demonstrated that what you've just said isn't really true. I mean, we, we've kept our influence. We've, we've been the biggest European supporter of, uh, of Ukraine. And in Eastern Europe, I think that, that's strongly recognised in our... Uh, you know, the, the reputation of the UK has, uh, has, has risen there. Um, and I think that's... You can carry that over to, to almost anything else. The, the sort of things we were co cooperating with the EU when we were inside, I don't really see why we can't cooperate when we're on the outside. And certainly the Horizon Programme is one of those. I mean, we'll sign up to the Horizon Programme later this year. It's no, no doubt about it. They were just using it as a bargaining counter over the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's now been sorted, so they'll, they'll let us into Horizon. Um, I'm not sure that matters very much, but, but, uh, but it, will, uh, it, it, it will happen. So I think the things you listed don't seem to me to come to very much in the end, but, uh, but, but, but we can... But, but they mean okay. a lot. They mean, right. they, they mean we'll a lot to you, and I can. We'll, we'll let we'll let you have as you're a speaker, Graham. We'll let you have the last word. Although there are many other words that will be said. Okay. Uh, well, let's give a round of applause to both our speakers. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll resume at uh, four for a final talk.
I'll t start with net zero um, because we're going to have a series of workshops following this conference because this conference is the last of a set of con conferences which have been uh, organized by the Trust uh, and which was uh, basically managed and very much hands-on organized by Professor Philip Arrestis, who can't be with us, but uh, who uh, we're grateful for in you know, continuing the work that we've been doing. Philip moves in the same circles as central bankers. So Philip will fly out to Brazil and talk to the central bankers of Brazil or indeed uh, many, many different countries. So he's, uh, but he's working from home rather than being with us. Um, my talk, unfortunately, fortunately I have got a microphone, um, is about solving the cost of living crisis for the UK. But of course, this crisis is in many countries and some countries have taken the pol policies to offset it and do something about it and indeed we heard uh, from Francisco in the first session the, the policies that Mexico has followed and I think, I mean I heard, I, I talked to Rogelio about this and I saw the, how important and how revolutionary, revolutionary that approach was in solving what is a terrible problem for many many people the fact that they can hardly afford to, in this country, to heat their homes and they can hardly afford to buy basic, basic foods. Basic foodstuffs have shot up in price um, to quite a lot of people's upset and horror. Um, and at the same time, the, the, number, the amount of food going to food banks has gone down because people have needed the food for themselves. So that's where we are. Um, so, I'm going to talk about understanding the system that we're talking about, the causes of the crisis, the effects of the crisis, and the solutions of the crisis. Uh, and the solutions I want to talk about are those which combine net zero, and by net zero I mean a transition to a net zero g greenhouse gas emission economy, world economy. It has to be world, everyone has to do it, everyone, every institution. Um, and combining that with equity, effectiveness, and efficiency, the three E's, which um, I believe uh, we should assess every policy and project. So the economic system. This is um, a view of the economic system as I think it operates. Uncertainty, money endogenous created by the system, Effective demand drives all the other things. It's demand that drives, it's not supply. The economy is structured through institutions, institutions, institutions. This is a Downing College institution. The trust is an institution. Institutions is a very broad term for, <laughs> as you say, rules, norms, customs, laws, households, industries, nation states. These are institutions, they have they, they work within boundaries, hence the space and space-time economics, and these boundaries change through time, and these institutions evolve through time. This is all essential in understanding the system. It's a dynamic system, and we, know, we hardly know it at all. We only see it's the outcome. You know, the great financial crisis, 2008, another one which is far bigger, which is about to happen, which is unfolding as I speak Economic behaviour is social, institutional, macro and cannot be derived from micro behaviour. It's such a nonsense to think a state's behaviour can be derived from a household's behaviour. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. Um, path dependency. Path dependency. That's time. Time moves one way forwards. I'll say that again because path dependency is central to, for example, the dramatic cost and dramatic fall in the cost of renewables, solar, wind. We've seen the transformation of the energy system because of path dependency. And if you've not got that in your economics, and it's not in neoclassic economics, you're done for. 
How can you possibly understand the evolution of the world economy without path dependency? And then finally, the capitalist economy is an open system. It draws on natural resources, obviously, and it tend ten tends towards inequalities in income and wealth, as well as it tends towards the destruction of the natural, natural environment, and we shall all go extinct in the end, perhaps 400 years, if we continue you know, following the, uh, the greed that comes out of um, unrestrained, what? Unrestrained following of a neoliberal ideology. All right, so I thought I'd compa compare Keynes' general theory with New Keynesian. A New Keynesian is, for example, Paul Kr Krugman is a New Keynesian. Skid Stiglitz is a New Keynesian. Uh, with space-time post-Keynesianism. And in common we have the national income accounts, social accounting, input-output, effective demand in the short term, liquidity preference, consumption functions, multiplies. But the arrest are different. Ethics is different. Keynes had animal spirits. New Keynesian is Benthamite, basically. Jeremy Bentham, utilitarianism. Uh, Space-time post-Keynesian is observed behaviour. We humans are yeah. satisficing altruistic punishers in evolving social groups. Yes? Yes? Oh, we punish all right. We punish socially and we punish privately. Uncertainty is pervasive. Time and equilibrium. Equilibrium is nonsense. I will not use that word unless to criticise. Equilibrium is in the heads of those who use the word. It's not, it doesn't exist. We're not in equilibrium here. Downing College is not in equilibrium. The economy is not in equilibrium. It's a, an idea in economists' heads, and they persist in putting their theories around that concept, and they've been done it. Even Keynes did it. Very disappointing. <laughs> oh, I like to say that sort of thing. <laughs> Finally, analysis. Um, honestly, general theory in New Keynesian, it's not scientific. It is not scientific. It's rhetorical, diagrammatic, the output gap. What on earth is that? Could you measure it? To talk, tell me about, if there are any neoclassicals here, neoclassical economists, tell me how you measure the short run. What is the short run? How long is it? Two seconds? Ten minutes? Three months? A year? Now, if you were scientific, you'd actually have a definition of the short run. They don't. It moves from model to model. Um, I don't have a definition of short run because the short run is whatever you want it to be. The short run in terms of climate change is the next hundred years, right? No, oh, press the wrong button. Yes, that one. So the causes of the crisis. Um, the first one, interestingly, is the reduced role and the reducing role of emerging economies. Emerging economies are China, the Far East, economies which have had very low wages in relation to their export, their, peop their countries they're exporting to. Right, so uh, this is all a bit tricky, but it's quite clear that, that uh, the joining of China to the World Trade Organization and the continuing low cost of Chinese exports or imports into the United States, for example, had a major effect on keeping the rate of inflation very low until the great financial crisis. And indeed, many economists thought that, uh, you know, the problem of inflation had been solved, amazingly. The problem of the cycle had been solved, even. And the problem of, you know, we were going to emerge into nirvana. What we actually emerged into was the great financial crisis and the bankers having to save the banks. The bankers saved the banks. That's what happened. If you look at the detail of it, the crisis was engineered and managed 
uh, by the bankers. Lehman Brothers went bust and was then saved in a week. And during that week, all sorts of crimes were committed, financial crimes. But we won't talk about that. That's a whole lecture in itself. In fact, it's not just one lecture, it's a, <laughs> a lifetime of research. So that's the first one. The second one, obviously, the COVID, Russian invasion, supply chains breaking, and then the deliberate cutting of supplies of energy and foodstuffs. That was, you know, a wartime. Everyone knows it was wartime. I mean, pipes were blown up in the Baltic Sea. You know, grain silos were blown up deliberately to cause famine and starvation, deliberately. Does anyone support Russia here in its invasion of Ukraine out of interest? Um, then we have to say it is true that inflation is, can be systemic and that inflation breeds inflation. When you have lots of prices going up, food prices, then people say, oh, I better put my price up or my wage up. It's all expectations after all, isn't it? Inflation is all about expectations. <laughs> it's not and the past, because the past guide our expectations. And then finally, some of inflation is obviously administered. Some prices are determined by world markets, oil obviously, metal agriculture. Others are fixed. Look at iPhones. They're fixed. It's a world product. I, I, got a, I bought an iPhone in November, still the same price now as it was then. And it's fixed across countries, because they don't, Apple doesn't like cross-country trading. So what, what, what happened when iPhone, the iPhone supply chain broke? They started using algorithms to um, ration. Now, algorithmic rationing um, is something I don't think we actually want to see because you've got to think of the Stasi and you've got to think of what's going on in China if robots are going to tell us how much we can have, how many phones we can own, which is the way things are going at the moment. So, of course, the UK had a few extra things. Uh, monetary and fiscal policy since 2010 has been a complete disaster. I mean, talk about mismanagement. And it's been going on since the 2010 crisis, um, which... Well, the 2010 crisis, I mean, it, that 2010 crisis was, in fact, the end of the, uh, uh, the great financial crisis. And Brexit, what's Brexit done? It's undermined confidence. It's weakened trade and it's weakened the pound. Political division has led to very poor policy making and major errors such as the trust quasi quatang episode, which is an episode of shame in British economic policy making. I mean, when, I, when, when the Prime Minister gave a speech about economic growth, and it was quite clear she had no idea what she was talking about, it, it was shocking. And then finally, <laughs> the rapid, unexpected and rapid rise in UK interest rates, that has shocked the system and it, in fact has led to more inflation because of hoarding and all the rest of it and increased volatility. You know, interest rates going up, they're still going up, they're still going up. I mean, is this the right policy? I don't think so. But, you know, I thought I would uh, give you a bit of uh, technology here, i.e. a chart which shows from The Economist um, and it's... It's data stream. I mean, I'm, you could argue by this, that, and the next thing. The main point here is the Phillips curve, the beloved Phillips curve of new Keynesian. I don't think neoclassicals have ever heard of the Phillips curve, but certainly new Keynesians have. I, I'm afraid that's lost its power. It's lost its power, uh, and <laughs> you're not going to be able to... If you look at 2010 to 2019, you're not going to get much relationship between inflation and unemployment, and I think you will find that in Mexico, that any relationship is just gone. It's just indeterminate, the relationship, because there isn't one. I mean, 
there could be one. It could be one induced by behaviour of producers, but from that data set there isn't one, and there certainly isn't one in terms of financial crisis and economic turmoil. So that's now we're coming on to the cause of the crisis, a list of uh, rather unhappy things, division, poverty, mortality, morbidity, inequality, loss in well-being, loss in welfare, loss in self-respect. Loss in self-respect. Think of that. You can't measure that, can you? Some people just say, I've given up. And what do they do when they've given up? They die, typically. So, how to solve it? First of all, we should, we as a country, or we as the Western world, we should recognise that we are at war. The effects that we're seeing are wartime effects. They're unprecedented losses of GDP, unprecedented increases in inflation in a very short time, which is typically what happens during a war. And moreover, this war is not just in Ukraine. The war is a war of ideas. It's a war of Russia, a whole country, f warring against the West, warring against Western values, warring against Western democracy, undermining it with stooges. I won't mention names, but there are many of them. Um, so, if we're at war, we need wartime responses which would be rapid, flexible, regulated, local and politically accepted solutions. That's what I'm putting forward. That's what you'd find in wartime. Everyone working together. That's what we saw in COVID, didn't we? In the response. Communities coming together, helping each other. Worldwide, this is going, going on. Except perhaps in China, which has a different approach to these things. I won't talk about China, because China is very interesting in its response to COVID. Um, and only in China could what that response have taken place. I'll just say two words about that response. When the, um, the political situation in China became untenable at the end of COVID, the Chinese government changed policies in two weeks. Complete 180 degrees turn, complete from one to another. That was amazing. I don't think any other country could have done that. And only with a Chinese, in a, a communist centrally planned state could you do that. Just change like that. And it seems to have worked. And think, I think it has worked, but we'll see. So, of course, those, um, that, that wartime, a wartime economy requires new institutions because I don't think the army wants to get involved. I mean, ask the army, to ask the navy to uh, police the channel and the navy says, sorry, Home Minister, Home Secretary, sorry. Um, we took an oath to save lives. We will not allow lives to be lost in the channel. Um, so, new institutions, for example, and I'm not pretending that I can solve. I think it requires a, um, a complete change and shift in approach. It requires new institutions, for example, local assemblies dis dispersing new money via such projects. Now, we know all about as local assemblies. You can see them on Newsnight, right? Politicians are doing it all the time. They're trying to find out what people want and then uh, meet those desires. But then maybe the government should actually be doing leading. It shouldn't just be following what people want. Think about that. A, le a government of leaders rather than a government of followers of populism or populist. People, people just you know, want to do good. Well, we all want to do good, hopefully. So such projects funded nationally, monitored regionally, learning from others, and by trial and error. That's how we move forward. The human race moves forward by trial and error all the time. Successful companies make mistakes. Most young companies die. You know, death by trial and error. 
They do. Of course they do. It's called the Valley of Death. And uh, typically with a little small company, some small companies, of course, grow into very big ones. Apple and you know, Google and Facebook. Think of Facebook at its start. Um, because most, most small companies come from ideas, but if the idea isn't tested and then lessons learned and then moves different ways, finding out which is successful, which fails, the company fails. So the successful companies are successful because they do trial and error. So now coming to the key areas, which is what we learn from the Mexican experiment, it's not, it's not an experiment, you're actually doing it. Plus, learning from what you're doing by, you know, the changing things at the border, which is very interesting. But, I mean, we could, any country can do that. We could change things at our ports. And when, in a way, we are doing, because we're having these port, special port areas. Although, I'm not sure I've designed them the way they have been. So, we need a new basic needs price index. So, that would be basic needs and the prices of basic needs and put it into an index. There are indexes which are similar to that. It's fairly easy for the, the ONS to do that. Uh, then interested parties then are to apply basic needs. Basic needs, <laughs> interested parties applying basic needs agree on coordinated and central supply supply yielding economies of scale. That reads as a sentence. So, interested parties, who would they be? Well, the big food manufacturers, right? Um, who are supplying to the big supermarkets already basic needs in terms of the essentials or the all supermarkets you go there, you see their shelves of what are considered basic needs, potatoes and veg and other things. Um, they agree on coordinated and central su centralised supply, yielding economies of scale. So, every country, more or less, in the West, and I expect there are exceptions, the food industry tends to be dominated by very large companies. Think of the supply of sugar in the United Kingdom. Two companies, one does the importing, and the other does it from, you know, basically sugar turnips. Um, so this is, this is an industrial policy which of course has went out with, I don't know, a very long time ago. We, we used to have industrial policies in the 1960s and 70s we had industrial policies. Um, they were overthrown in favour of the market. But in times of warfare, in a time of war, you, the armaments industry is essentially nationalised. You produce this and you produce that. I suspect that's what's going on with the armament industry in the United Kingdom at the moment. They're told what to do and they make a lot of money out of it. So that's where you get the economies of scale. And then finally, the wage rate increases and are negotiated in relation to the basic needs price index. So they might be a little bit more than the price index. But the idea, of course, is to generate a dynamic in which the economies of scale become dynamic. The, pr the price index f starts to fall uh, and you f have a dynamic which reduces the overall rate, overall rate of inflation, but at the same time um, improves the, um, the inequity of people, not being, of people at the lower, who are poor, because they don't have, don't have the resources that they should have, uh, not being able to afford the food. And this, of course, allows it to happen, because the prices will then fall of the basic goods. Um, and the wage rates, or the minimum rate, wage rate, would go up with... I mean, <laughs> I talk, I, I say this, but of course some such things can be and should be modelled. So you, you can't... This is just an idea as opposed to um, actually solving it. I'm not solving it, I'm saying pointing a way forward for any country. Any country can do this. I mean, you know, basic needs is basic to humans. We have basic needs. Now, you can say, does having a television 
a basic need. Does having a mobile phone have a basic need? Probably does these days. Having electricity supply, a basic need? Yes, probably. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Could you just put up the previous slide, just in case that's something that we want to come back to? Um, okay, any questions or comments? Uh, okay, let me start with uh, Jeff and then Graham. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, actually, I'd quite like to see that slide again when you compared Keynesian to Neo-Keynesian and stuff. Um, okay. I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, I mean, but on that, I, I mean, uh, yeah, that's very, very interesting. Can I have a copy? <laughs> yeah, you, yes, okay. I mean, you can have a copy. Um, <laughs> I don't think we a copy on a, a virtual copy or I don't mind virtual I've, copy. I've got a printer um, but um, I mean I accept what you say but I mean in, in limited ways surely there is an equilibrium and in limited ways there is a um, a short term so all these terms are relative aren't they I mean you you either have a relative equilibrium so if you've had um, employment running at 95 percent or something or other for 10 years you'd think there's, a, there's an element of stability there yes. but it, i wonder whether you're confusing the terms yes. static and dynamic uh, yes. with equilibrium and non-equilibrium yes. fair enough so i'll give you a glib answer the, if you go to mill road there's a cemetery there you'll find equilibrium um i'll give you a more nuanced answer Oh, ca carry on. Carry on. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, the more nuanced answer about equilibrium. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right, all right. Enough with, enough with the jokes. Enough carry on, Terry. Enough <laughs> of the jokes, yes. Um, the more nuanced answer, I have to stand up, is. Um, Um, stability. I, I, I will use the word stable. Yeah. I'm quite happy with the word stable yeah. Yeah. because the word stable also has opposites. In unstable, mm -hmm. okay, or volatile, not volatile. But equilibrium, what it, is it un, in equilibrium or is it non equilibrium? Because equilibrium is an idea. Whereas stable is more um, also an idea, but it's more something you could say, you know, this table is stable. I didn't mean for that alliteration, but there you are. Um, or you're stable as a person because you're not frail or you're not bouncing around on a, in a gym. And e equilibrium implies it, it suggests there are forces tending towards, and that's which stability doesn't. I mean, you may observe stability and wonder why it's persisted, but that's a different thing, it seems to me. Uh, Graham. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that, Terry. Uh, as an as a old style Cam Cambridge Keynesian like yourself, you, you won't be surprised that I. I I agreed almost entirely with your, your economic analysis, but I'd like to hear a bit more about what you meant by post-banking crisis monetary policy. You were very critical, but you didn't say what, what oh. it should have been. Perhaps you could well, say a little more. Chancellor Osborne and his policies, that's uh, who I'm criticizing. Well, that's critical, not, not, he wasn't banking. Did you have a criticism of the monetary policy as well? Oh, so the whole thing. Fiscal I mean, austerity, yeah. <laughs> the monetary policy, which was a combination of quantitative easing and um, zero interest rates and various trial and error interventions in the market. I mean, a lot of experimentation went on after 2010 to see what might work, and none of it did. I mean, did it work? No, it did not. We had, we had moved from an average rate of growth we're talking about productivity, but we can also talk about output, about 1.7%. I mean, I think you had a 2%, and it went down to, um, what was it, zero, one point. Now it's expected to be 0.7, or maybe even 0.5. That is uh, economic, um, I mean, you can say other countries also had a reduction, but I mean, compared to what 
Uh, I mean, I've been looking at economic growth for a very long time. It used to be, we used to talk about it going up to 3% per annum. I mean, not over a decade. 3% a year, not over 10 years. We're talking about it over seven years, are we, or 10 years? Shocking. And why, how has this come about? Complete lack of confidence in the banking system, which was engineered by the fact that bankrupt banks were saved, and so what happens after you have that kind of uh, global effect, where it's obvious that the bankers went off with larger bonuses after the crisis, everyone knows what went on. People virtually know in the, um, the only country that actually prosecuted bankers and sent them to prison, as far as I know, was Iceland, which actually did have trials on, you know, the banking crimes. There were crimes. And some of the crimes were concealed by changes in the law. That's not right. It's not right that the bankers should change the law so that they can't go bankrupt. That's not right. That's, that's, that's the system going completely wrong. Now, this is not new, as Richard will know, can testify. We had a conference in uh, November 2008 on the banking crisis where we produced solutions which still hold water today because I've looked at them again. So does that answer your question? Probably not. Somewhat. <laughs> Somewhat. I, suppose you, I suppose your point, Graham, was that the Bank of England cut interest rates to nothing, and what else might they have done? Is that, yeah, that was it, yeah. Well, the quantitative easing is what they did, isn't it, on a big scale? Do, do, you, so, do you think they shouldn't have done that? Oh, no, or? I think they should have done. Oh, okay, but right, I think okay. the fact that they tried to do it all through money and finance was the mistake. Oh, okay. Because what happened yeah. to house prices? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, think about houses, housing in this country, which is exceptional. Ha housing in this country is another world altogether. First of all, of course, obviously, most of the houses are second or third or fifth or nth hand, right? They're old, right? They're old. Now, they may be improved. So we're talking about a market, a financial market for old things that are not produced, right? So it could be for paintings. It could be for anything that's old. It could be for gold coins. But the, the way our housing market has developed over the years, and it's peculiarly British, and it's to do with inheritance, and the fact that people's wealth, real wealth, is in their housing, right? In other countries, it might be in their crypto. Heaven forfend. Would you like your wealth to be in crypto? Probably not. So that's why I make such a distinction between real assets and financial assets. Because financial assets can become worthless, just like that, like crypto. Yeah. Like the 14 billion that that man Bankman Fried pinched, stole from the investors in his crypto scheme. And what did he do? Lost most of it, he claims, went off to the Bahamas, then was arrested, now he's in jail. Bankman Fried is his name. Okay. I'm still not clear, Terry, what you thought the Bank of England would actually be doing for it. I, uh, look. It's as if you're asking me to be, to go there and be in the Bank of England and what it should have done. But as the Irishman would say, I would never start from there, would I, if I wanted to get to a destination? Yeah, if I understood your point, it was that the, 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 the entire uh, scope of policy, including fiscal policy, was, was inappropriate. And they were relying on monetary policy completely. alone. I to, mean, they had a wrong analysis of the past yeah, to yeah. begin with. I mean, it wasn't Labour that caused yeah. the, <laughs> the crisis. It was the, the banking system. It was a yeah. systemic effect. The system. We're in a very complex system which we don't understand, which is leading to, shall I say it, um, extinction of humanity. That's what it's doing. And we're not st we haven't stopped it. Okay, let's uh, run out of time for um, any more questions or comments. Yeah, Anne. Thank you. Um, very interesting um, slide there, and I want to study that more. Um, but the question I want to ask is about unpacking your concept of basic needs and yes. the solution that you propose to yes. how to meet those basic needs. Um, I mean, you've just pointed out that housing is a stock, a historic stock. 
and there arises the question of how it should be modernised and distributed. Mm. Um, there are other things which are not market goods at all, like nature, clean air, access to green space, etc. There are other things which are stocks of infrastructure, like the power generating structure uh, and the railway lines, yeah. which are, if you like, historic public yeah. goods yeah. stocks. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the whole question of distribution and uh, how your idea of wage bargaining being related to a basic needs index doesn't deal with the question of benefits at all. And I mean, given that a large proportion of the population are not working, I mean, I think at best it's, it's still, you know, about 25%. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we need to see how those people will fit into the picture. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thanks. Well, Do you yes. want to respond? Or? Yes, no, I'll respond. Um, uh, you're talking about a, di a, di a way of looking at the world which is, I agree with entirely, I mean, I'm with you, and which conventional mainstream economics does not deal with properly at all. And the way I approach that is to, to think of... Uh, things that, that we consider, you and I would consider good and things that we, you and I would consider bad. And also to think of things that you and I would consider marketed, what is marketed and what is not. And the marketed ones are of course to do with the economy. The non-marketed ones, you know, the view of the moon last night, that's not marketed. I was, it was free for anyone to look up. That's non, not in the market. And yet, we value it. Of course we do. You know, when I took a photograph of that and put it on Twitter, people liked it. They liked to look at that and think of the full moon. Because the full moon has its effects, as we all know. Well, we ought to. <laughs> well, some of us turn, grow lots of hairs on the full moon. And then we go out and roar in the night. Not, not me, of course. But, I mean... You get the idea, uh, but also you can divide up everything, not just into good and bad, into marketing and non-marketing, but you can also divide it into what's collective, what we all enjoy collectively, like the rail system. Well, maybe we don't enjoy it, but we put up with it to get from A to B, or the road system, or the water system. And you think about those collective resources, which should be good, but in the case of the water quality on our shores, it's not good. We think about that and we think, well, maybe a collective decision should be put, should be taken collectively to put that right. I think most people want clean water and feel that they have a right to it. I mean, on the question that you were raising about, um, you talked about wages being indexed or being yes, negotiated. Yes, yes, yes. But, but people whose incomes are not coming from wages so uh, welfare recipients. I mean, well, presumably you would base that on related to the wage increases or the, the, or the price index? I mean, that's... I don't... I haven't really thought about how to... Uh, this is very broad. You know, my solution was obviously has to be very broad. And I, I didn't emphasise enough the locality issue because the problem of benefits is a locality issue. You don't have much of a problem of benefits in Cambridge, in Trumpington. There will be pockets of it, but not generally. So West Cambridge tends to be, or Eddington, right? I mean, maybe there are homeless people, in fact, there are homeless people at Eddington, but I don't think they come from Eddington. Eddington is a little village which has been built by, with university help, I believe, which is on the outskirts and mm. which has wind tunnels in it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it it's can be very cold and bleak. Mm. But okay. I'm not... Have I answered your question? Well, just the, so, so you haven't dealt... Or you you yeah, speak... I, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I think what I'm looking for is some idea of what the benefit system in your scenario would look like. Thank you. Um, the benefit system... Uh, each locality should be looking after its vulnerable defined as people who are homeless or want to have... Some people are homeless, don't want to live in a home. They're happy what they're doing. Or they're not happy, but they can't see a way out. 
and they won't accept any way out. They're just doing what they're doing, got used to it. But some people want a home, and I think it's up to the localities to, to seek to provide them with a home. And I'll just take the homeless as an example of people on benefits, because the homeless do get benefits, and they look, they're desperate for benefits, actually. If you talk to the homeless, it's when they're next going to get their money from the benefit that they're going to live to the, for the next, you know, whatever they, the bed for the night or whatever. So I think it should be a local solution and that the benefit system, system should be greatly expanded. And so you could... Doesn't that go back to the... Sorry. Uh, doesn't that rather go back to the days of money on the parish and the workhouse? Sorry. Money, money... Oh, the parish and the workhouse? Yes. But uh, I mean, why, why would we do... Um, why would the the um, pre-1940s system was very much geared to local application administered by local administrations. Um, but its fault was that you know, people could be shunted from one area to another. Yes. Well, uh, let me put on the, my solution because you'll see that I have thought of that sort of... Mm. Interested parties applying basic needs agree on coordinate and centralised supply. Um, and such projects are funded nationally. So it's a national funding. I'm not saying national, like the like National Health Service is nationally funded. So the funding should go nationally. It should, I think the workhouses, the poor houses, etc., you have to ask how that was charity, wasn't it? I'm not saying the charity. I'm saying it's, it's, this is not charity. Let's be clear, this is not charity. It's not benefits. It's a, each... each uh, it's more of a regionally devolved system. Yes, yeah. it's an, yeah. a, a regional regionally evolved, evolved system yeah. from the present one. Mm. I'm not... This isn't going back. It's, it's going forward. We, we're about at time, so unless there's another burning question. Uh, thank you very much, Terry, for that thank provocative you. talk. <laughs> and... Do you want to say some words uh, to, to close, close the, conference? the conference? Yes, well, I, I certainly would like to thank Anella, and I'd also like Anella to say a few words, and Ellen, um, and I like basically, you know, to open the floor to people to say if they've enjoyed themselves. Uh, and <laughs> can I make some more jokes? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Terry, and uh, thank you to everyone who was here today and who was following us via, via, via the webcast. Um, it's been a great day, um, and I'd like to thank Ellen, who has been doing a lot of work to make this conference possible. So thank you very much for your support. <laughs> and, and thank you to Terry, of course, for all these ideas and speakers yes. and so, <laughs> I do want to end up by... And all the chairs who have been helping us. Yes. And particularly to say thank you for our guests who travelled yes. over from Mexico just to be here for, with us today. And I think another applause to you. <laughs> so thanks again and safe travels home. Well, one last thing was about our future programme of events. Um, because we're planning a series of workshops... Um, and one of the first one is going to be on, I've got to get this right, net zero, cr money, crime. So it's about the role of criminals in preventing governments reaching net zero. And why would they do that? Well, you could say that certain presidents have behaved in criminal manner and have caused the world to use far more coal and than it would otherwise use because of the cutting off of gas supplies, naming no names. Now that is criminal behaviour. In fact, it's criminal behaviour of the highest order of human wickedness. So, so there's a workshop on crime and... Because clearly, crime is, has an effect on achieving net zero in some countries. Uh, and we're looking at that issue. Um, so that's one. Then um, Carolina Alves, she wants to um, have a workshop on time and money in economics, in economic theory. And uh, that's obviously going to be very interesting because uh, 
time, of course, is of the essence, as we know. Uh, and then other ideas we've had on, on, on workshops. Um, we discussed a couple, but we still yes, need to do... Law, law further, legal yeah. boundaries, legal boundaries and, uh, and um, development. How cities and railroads get fun funded by you know, rise, r increases in the price of land. That's a huge issue. And then again, uh, migration. The whole problem of urban versus rural. So you can see there's <laughs> a lot of very interesting topics. We'll but they're all about we'll net zero. You, yeah, we'll keep you posted about yes. next events. Okay, well. So if anyone wants to say a couple of words, I'm happy to hand over the mic. But otherwise we can just close and, and go home. Thank Let's you. Let's close that. So the meeting is Thank closed. You. Thank you. Very good.